three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. The eyes of the world look to the skies. NASA's historic mission of science and sentiment is finally underway as 77-year-old U.S. Senator John Glenn and the Discovery astronauts ride into the record books. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Q&A. Well, 36 years ago, John Glenn was the first American to orbit the Earth. He was instantly catapulted into fame as an American hero. Now at 77, he returns to space, having used a powerful combination of political clout, persistence, and good health to convince NASA to put him on a shuttle mission. As a politician, Glenn was always interested in issues involving aging, and his purpose on discovery is to serve as a sort of medical guinea pig. NASA scheduled 10 experiments, all designed to measure the effects of weightlessness on the aging process. We've got two guests who have some idea what John Glenn must be thinking of right now. Buzz Aldrin of the moon landing Apollo 11 fame is joining us from the Kennedy Space Center. He's now chairman of the board of directors of the National Space Society. And alongside him will be Ken Reitler, a former shuttle pilot and naval, av naval aviator who has close, close experience with the NASA Space Shuttle program. And before they begin fielding your questions and comments, CNN's Miles O'Brien has a closer look at the Discovery astronauts and their mission. On the brink of his fifth flight in orbit, Discovery Commander Kurt Brown is a seasoned space traveler who likens rides in the shuttle to camping trips. And you unpack and set up your camp, and you found the good fishing hole, and the fish are biting, and about that time you have to pack up and go home, and you're not able to take advantage of all the things that, that you really got going for you. So much to do, so little time. That's how the Discovery 7 views their mission. Spaniard Pedro Duque is the rookie of the group. He's been waiting six years for a flight. He will be the first person from his country in space. His crewmate, Jackie Mukai, is the first Japanese woman in orbit. More than 80 experiments will be staged on the decks of Discovery. They run the gamut from plant growth to oyster toadfish to cockroaches in outer space. But the crew isn't worried. NASA assures us the roaches will float in, but they won't float out. And joining the menagerie, a very famous human guinea pig. John Glenn will participate in studies looking at changes in how we sleep, how we balance, and how the heart reacts to time spent without gravity. We learn some new things, which we're trying to do, and that's the purpose of the whole program, is to learn new things that benefit people right here. And if I, uh, at this stage of my life, can have an opportunity to do some of that, then I don't look at being a guinea pig as being bad. I look at being a guinea pig as being very, very good. The crew will also be doing some important work outside the shuttle. One of those jobs, deploying the sun-gazing Spartan satellite. Even by NASA standards, this is a very busy shuttle right. mission. This is, we think it's a very unique flight. Of course, any flight that you're on you think is the best flight ever invented. But we're very excited about this one because it's, a, it's an integration of, I think, everything the shuttle was ever designed to do or had ever been envisioned for the use of a space shuttle. No doubt it's the most scrutinized mission in a very long time. The crew of Discovery knows no matter how it goes, the whole world will be watching. Miles O'Brien, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center. We know many of you are ready to ask questions of our guests, Buzz Aldrin and Ken Reitler. Remember, you can do so by email, fax, or telephone. And we will try to get to the chat room next week. It looks like we're still having trouble getting that up. Matt Ivan, our moderator, will be back with the chatters in, uh, in the chat room once we can get back to that, hopefully, at the beginning of next week. Well, let's get to the Kennedy Space Center. Gentlemen, you're there in the thick of things. Buzz Aldrin, starting with you, what sort of atmosphere surrounded this launch? I think there was a lot of excitement. Uh, it was a wonderful story. and. Uh, we had a lot of storytellers around here, uh, at least 3,800 uh, press credentials at one count. And it was a wonderful story that uh, I think the American people and the people all around the globe uh, really relished in, uh, in seeing it unfold today. Uh, a little bit of a hold just to give us a little bit of concern, and then uh, off we went into orbit. Ken Reitler, let me get your perspective on that too. You've obviously not, you're not a, uh, you're very familiar with the space missions and so on. What do you think about the particular atmosphere around this one? Well, I am uh, familiar with this experiment and the, and the, uh, the flight in general and the, the, I think that it was an electric environment that surrounded uh, from, from the very beginning. I got here about five o'clock this morning and there were people buzzing uh, and uh, it, the, the excitement level just picked up from there. Uh, and the, of course, the uh, the drama of the, the couple of holds, as Buzz mentioned, really added to the the uh, the drama and the excitement. I want to get to an email question because our viewers get a chance to talk on this show. And uh, Buzz Aldrin, I want to put this question that came from India on the internet. 
to you. It says the critics claim that Glenn's space voyage is merely for the record books. They claim his journey is for NASA's gain. How do you respond? Well, it may be for the record books, and it's a great uh, record for uh, John personally. I think it's a tremendous achievement uh, for NASA. Uh, I think it gives us a wonderful opportunity for NASA to be able to, to have its story of spaceflight unfold from the beginnings uh, of the first American in orbit. Uh, we can review things and come right up to where we are today, and we're right on the verge of uh, launching the elements of the International Space Station. And I know that uh, many of us are, uh, are waiting with great expectation to see uh, that uh, great uh, assemblage begin to unfold. Uh, it's a great uh, tribute to the international cooperation that's been put forth. Now, Ken, this uh, email also came in from India on the internet. It says, do you take an interest in global space activities? For example, are you aware of the Indian Space Agency? Yes, we are, and uh, we are working with Lockheed Martin to try to be uh, providing services to just about all of the space agencies of the world. And we have uh, a lot of contracts right now and a lot of work, and that's spreading. Uh, we're particularly interested in uh, working with the, the members of the uh, Space Station International Partners. But uh, eventually, we'd like to uh, be providing uh, services to all of the world's space agencies. We have our first caller on the line from England. Meta has a question. Go ahead, Meta. And your question, I understand, is for Buzz. Yes. Buzz Aldrin, greetings. Uh, you are, uh, after all, one of the astronauts. Uh, uh, what has NASA planned by way of missions to Mars, and could you yourself be hoped to be uh, one of the first uh, humans to land on Mars? Uh, well, I've given Mars an awful lot of thought uh, in the last uh, 15, 15 years of uh, observing what NASA has been doing. Uh, I focused a good bit of attention to how we could have uh, really uh, strategically economical, sustainable missions to Mars. Uh, and uh, it's very exciting to take uh, a bit of creativity that goes back to some of the original uh, work that I did in rendezvous techniques before I get into the space program and to see that uh, they, they can be applied. Uh, but I think before we think too much about uh, going to Mars, we need to think very much about putting lots and lots of people into space because that'll give us the opportunity to plan the, uh, the uh, next generation space shuttle. And I think uh, eventually it'll lead to the launching into space of large volume hotels in order to take care of those tourists. Well, we're just getting going on this Q&A as we talk about this historic day where John Glenn lifts off into space after 36 years. Buzz Aldrin and Ken Leitler are taking your questions. They'll be back in just a moment. Seventy-seven year old John Glenn, certainly the man of the hour. He and his fellow Discovery astronauts have launched into the space books and look into across, the record books. Uh, Welcome like back to Q&A, everyone. Glenn. We also have the remarkable Buzz Aldrin of moon landing Apollo 11 fame and Ken Reitler, former astronaut and test pilot with special knowledge of the NASA shuttle program, taking your questions. Buzz Aldrin, let me ask you about what John Glenn can expect physically. I mean, all those years ago, the body was taking all those stresses and strains more easily. What do you think he'll go through physically on this one at the age of 77? Uh, to me, I think zero gravity uh, is a very relaxing environment. Uh, the, the forces that are subject, you're subject to during launch are rather mild, and, uh, and they're uh, generally not in a, in a, in a way that uh, causes any particular discomfort. Uh, zero gravity itself is, is sort of a lazy man's life. Uh, your muscles are not stressed, your bones are not stressed. So as a result, you really need to do a good bit of exercise. Uh, he may have a little bit of trouble sleeping the first night or two. Uh, he may experience some um, uh, disturbing aspects of uh, uh, dis disorientation or nausea, but half the people do to varying degrees, but they usually recover from that uh, in a few days. I'm sure he's going to be spending a lot of time looking out the window, relishing the view that uh, he really didn't have very much of it uh, 36 years ago in uh, 
in his uh, brief three, three orbits that were very busy. Of course, a much longer trip this time. Well, we've got a caller on the line from the United Kingdom. Richard, your question, please. Oh, good. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm speaking from Newcastle upon Tyne in England. Hi. Buzz, um, do you get slightly embarrassed, in spite of your own personal achievements and all the Cosmonauts' achievements, that the engineering which takes you up on these flights is done so cleverly and accurately because the slightest thing wrong and there will be a complete failure. Nobody ever mentions the wonderful engineering that goes along with this. Ken Ryder, let me give that one to you. As I understand it, the, uh, the question it has to do with uh, what about failures and uh, That's right. we don't it's really talk about failures and the Always going the on a fine line, yes. Well, there is a, a lot of risk associated with space flight, just as there is risk associated with most things in, uh, in life. However, I guess I would answer that to say that, in my view, uh, the risk is worth it in the case of, uh, of space flight. We, uh, we need to be exploring. We're an exploring people. Uh, it's in our nature. Uh, and there's many, many good things that come as a result of our access to space. England on the line next with a question from Robert. Go ahead, Robert. What's your question? Oh. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to express my sympathy at the recent loss of um, Alan Shepard and John Holloman, of course. And I'd like to ask Buzz Aldrin, um, would you like to fly to the International Space Station when it's operational in a few years' time, when you perhaps would be a similar age to John Glenn now? Uh, well, I'm sure I would enjoy the opportunity to fly uh, in space again in the space shuttle or and, and anything that would give me that uh, wonderful experience. And it would be a particular treat to be able to go and visit uh, the International Space Station after it's been put together. I, I really don't think that opportunity is going to be provided me. I'm certainly not going to seek it. Uh, I've been working many years now trying to provide the opportunity and the climate and the uh, environment to begin to encourage uh, a lot of people around the world to really believe that space tourism and the opportunity for private citizens uh, is just around the corner and uh, we ought to start planning now for the next generation space shuttle system to be economical by taking people into space and that'll probably be 80 or 100 people uh, and very high flight rates in order to generate enough income for it to be economically uh, successful. Now, on that very note, we have an email that came in from New Zealand. Great to hear from New Zealand. This one was by internet. Although the walk on the moon was a great leap for mankind, do you believe the benefit justified the expense? What new areas of space exploration do you support? Ken Reitler, let me get an answer from you on that. Well, I think that uh, the, the cost of space exploration is high, no question. There are uh, a lot of competing kinds of programs uh, in our society. However, if you look at the return on the investment, it is tremendous. Uh, it's hard to imagine uh, today uh, watching television without live satellite uh, pictures from around the world. It's, a, it's hard to imagine dealing without having instantaneous access to weather around the world with satellite pictures. Uh, the over 30,000 documented cases of uh, uh, spin-offs technology is, is very clear in terms of its benefits to all of us. Uh, and we're just now beginning to realize a lot of the benefits in the area of, of medical research. So I believe that the investment that we're making is not nearly enough. We're getting a tremendous return on that investment. Frederick in Switzerland, what's your question? I wanted to ask uh, Buzz Aldrin whether, in his knowledge, this flight would have taken place anyway without John Glenn, and the addition of John Glenn would be the same as adding a specialist or a scientist on board. And secondly, whether the detractors of this flight are committing a disservice to the United States in its quest for leadership, continued leadership in science and technology. Uh, well, I think this flight was on the schedule uh, before it was decided to add uh, an additional person in the name of, uh, or in the person of John Glenn. Uh, certainly the flight would have taken place. There are many very significant experiments. Um, the addition uh, of, of a person like John to the flight uh, added a whole new dimension, I think, in the eyes of the people telling the story, the, uh, the journalists, uh, the reporters, all of who are here today, and, but I think in particular to the listeners, to the observers, it, it added a tremendous boost to their ability and their desire to want to learn more about the space program. And I think the, the sense is that if John can fly in space, maybe a number of us can also. And I think we ought to move uh, fairly rapidly to think about defining the next 
space shuttle system and perhaps begin experiments uh, on this shuttle system when the space is available and when it's appropriate uh, to be able to do that, to uh, lay the groundwork. Uh, I think one of the early things we could do is to take a journalist into space to uh, professionally report on the things that uh, that person observes and why a person would take risks like this, uh, what is the value of doing this, and to uh, perhaps put into perspective the great attention that is paid to a flight like this that brings so many people out. If we had had a problem, it I'm sure would, in my estimation, probably have been blown out of proportion uh, in, in respect to uh, uh, what the risk uh, that is involved in. Uh, we lose a lot of lives on the highways, but that's more or less a common occurrence. We expect that. Well, uh, well Buzz Aldrin, I want to say just that we've run out of time on Q&A. We thank you both for uh, joining us, Buzz Aldrin and Ken Reitler, taking your questions there. Buzz, shouldn't, uh, we should point out we saw the stars there on your tie on the day your colleague goes up into space. Good luck to both of you. Thanks very much for taking questions from around the world on Q&A. Nice to be with you today. Our pleasure. Dem alten Astronauten wird die letzte Mission seiner Karriere nicht im Anzug stecken bleiben. Der Held aus den ersten Tagen des Weltraumrennens sieht sich nicht als Symbol und nicht als Tourist, sondern als legitimes Mitglied des Teams, das seinen Platz an Bord hat verdient hat. Es gibt mindestens neun Gebiete, auf denen Schwerelosigkeit ähnlichen Effekt hat wie das Altern auf der Erde. Kombiniert man beides wie bei mir, kann man Erkenntnisse gewinnen über Knochenschwund, Kreislaufprobleme, orthopädischen Verfall und so weiter. Allein 45 Minuten wird Glenn jeden Tag brauchen, die Messgeräte am Kopf anzulegen. Ein anderes Experiment zum Schlafrhythmus mit dem Modehormon Melatonin wurde gestrichen. Warum, wird nicht gesagt. Der Weltraumspezialist der amerikanischen Wissenschaftlervereinigung sieht den ganzen medizinischen Aufwand mit freundlicher Skepsis. John Glenns zweiter Weltraumflug hat so viel mit Wissenschaft zu tun wie sein erster, nämlich wenig. Es geht um Politik, um nationale Begeisterung und um Werbung für das Weltraumprogramm. Wäre es um die Wissenschaft allein gegangen, hätte es einen geeigneteren Kandidaten gegeben. Story Musgrave, vor einem guten Jahr, im Alter von 61, aus dem Astronautenkorps geschickt, aus Altersgründen. Ich werde mich nicht an einem Flug beteiligen, an dem es nicht um die reine Weltraumforschung geht. Ich glaube nämlich an die Mission da oben. Story Musgrave kümmert sich heute um junge Leute. Er ist ein Modellastronaut aus der Zeit, in der keine Helden mehr geschaffen wurden. Sechs akademische Abschlüsse von Astronomie bis Literatur, Fighterpilot und auf dem wissenschaftlich erfolgreichsten Flug aller Zeiten, der Retter des Hubble-Teleskops. Über mich haben die über drei Jahrzehnte genaueste medizinische Daten. Wenn es wirklich um Wissenschaft gehen würde, wäre ich ein viel besserer Kandidat als Glenn. John Glenn ficht das alles nicht an. Sein Renommee und sein persönlicher Mut bringen der NASA, was ihr heute mehr fehlt als wissenschaftliche Daten. Weltraumbegeisterung, wie es sie seit fast 30 Jahren nicht mehr gegeben hat. Well, you could call it Mercury rising again. Former Mercury 7 astronaut John Glenn has been launched into space for a second time. He and six other crew members blasted off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida a little over an hour and a half ago. CNN's Kate Snow joins us now from Kennedy Space Center with more on the mission. Kate. Juanita, the excitement has been building for months, but you know the actual event only lasted mere seconds. After two short delays, Space Shuttle Discovery took off from here without a hitch. For engine start, five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. This 
Roger Discovery. Roll program. Roger Roll Discovery. Cape Canaveral hasn't seen crowds like this since the Apollo program. Thousands of anxious space watchers flocked to the shore to watch John Glenn's dream become reality. They came in cars and RVs. Some paid as much as $50 just for a parking spot. Closer to the launch pad, invited guests, members of Congress, and friends of the crew gathered to bid farewell to Glenn. Among the guests of honor, President and Mrs. Clinton. I think that uh, John Glenn going up today is a very good thing for America. We're going to learn a lot from it, and we're all going to, I think, be thrilled by it. And I'm just glad he was brave enough to do it. The weather couldn't have been better, and NASA reported no problems with equipment before the launch. The seven astronauts took their places in the Discovery Orbiter, lying flat on their backs, their feet straight up in the air, waiting for the moment of liftoff. The most uh, jittery moment is once uh, ignition takes place and you, you leave uh, the controlled, bolted down to the pad, uh, and you begin to go through a launch sequence. Because if there's anything wrong at that point, you can sway into the tower. Of course, that jittery moment is well past now. They got by the launch just fine. The Discovery is now in orbit. We did just learn, Juanita, about one small problem. NASA tells us that a panel did come off of the space shuttle as they were launching, just about two seconds after the main engines went on. That panel then impacted the right uh, engine nozzle of the center engine. So there is some concern about that, but NASA at this point is saying they don't expect that that minor difficulty will pose any threat to this mission over the next nine days. Reporting live from Kennedy Space Center, I'm Kate Snow. Now back to you. Kate, before you go, just describe for us the feeling at the Space Center as the shuttle lifted off. How emotional a moment was that? Absolutely emotional. It was um, exuberant. There were people cheering. There were people clapping. Now, where I am, I'm in a, an area with press, about 3,000 and more press people here for this launch. In, uh, across the way from me, about uh, 5, 10 miles from me, there were thousands, possibly even up to a million people watching on the beach, and they sent up a large cheer as well. And obviously one of the reasons for that uh, high emotion is the fact that John Glenn is such a legend and, and a hero in the United States. What about uh, to the rest of the world? How significant is this project, is this flight? To the rest of the world? Well, I think what's interesting is that when he first went up in 1962, we were in a very different atmosphere. Of course, the Cold War was underway. We were competing with the Soviet Union then in the space program, and so there was a lot of animosity. Hopefully now the rest of the world or sees John Glenn maybe in the same way that the United States does, which uh, is more just as an astronaut and someone who wants to do good for and help the cause of the elderly here in the United States. Kate Snow in Florida, thank you very much. A veteran pilot of in diesem Oktober wird ein wahrer amerikanischer Held, ein ausgezeichneter Pilot, ins Weltall zurückkehren. Hals und Beinbruch, John Glenn. Godspeed, John Glenn. Im letzten Januar erfüllte Bill Clinton seinem Parteifreund den größten Wunsch. Noch einmal da hinauf. Und Amerika feierte den Raumfahrtveteran. Seitdem bereitet sich der 77-Jährige auf seine Mission vor, hat unzählige Trainingsstunden absolviert und kennt sich im Modell des Space Shuttle schon so gut aus, dass er dem Präsidenten jede Kleinigkeit erklären kann. In den USA heißt der kommende Flug der Raumfähre Discovery nur die Glenn-Mission. Der offizielle Name ist STS-95. Ja, der Applaus war groß, als dann alles reibungslos verlief und die Schüler sitzen jetzt auch noch und warten eben darauf, dass die ersten Bilder kommen. Rund um Cape Canaveral hatten sich 300.000 Menschen eingefunden, um den Start live zu beobachten. So ein großes Interesse an einem Raumschiffstart hat es seit den Tagen der Mondflüge nicht mehr gegeben und die NASA kann zumindest mit dem Publicity-Erfolg, den sie heute gelandet hat, ziemlich zufrieden sein. Wie lange ist der Mensch aktiv und geistig wendig? Soll er, muss er? Mit 65 Jahren in den Ruhestand oder schon früher oder erst später. Die Fernsehwerbung und die Quotenforscher, die gewöhnen sich inzwischen an, all die abzuschreiben, die über 50 sind. Mit denen sei nicht mehr viel anzustellen. Heute ist einer in den Weltraum gestartet und er kreist jetzt hoch über unseren Köpfen. Der ist 77 Jahre alt. Natürlich ist es nicht das erste Mal, dass er eine solche Reise unternimmt. 
Doch immerhin das letzte Mal, es ist schon 36 Jahre her von der Expedition heute, verspricht sich die NASA wichtige Erkenntnisse über den Einfluss der Schwerelosigkeit speziell auf alte Menschen. Die Gegner des Experimentes, die wiederum bezweifeln, ob solch ein Studium von Rüstigkeit und Altersfitness denn wissenschaftlich auch wichtig sei. Wie auch immer, der Start in den Weltraum ist geglückt. Die Rakete zündete um 20.20 Uhr unserer Zeit. Präsident Clinton war dabei, um sich das anzusehen. Und für uns war Klaus-Peter Siegloch vor Ort. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Erinnerungen an 1962, als das Kontrollzentrum heute Abend John Glenn und seine sechs Discovery-Kollegen in den Weltraum schickte. Mehr als eine Viertelmillion Zuschauer verfolgten am Kennedy-Weltraumzentrum den Bilderbuchstart der Raumfähre, der sich noch zuletzt um 19 Minuten verzögert hatte, weil ein Flugzeug sich ins Startgebiet verirrte. So viele Journalisten, Fernsehkameras und Satellitentrucks waren noch nie bei einem NASA-Start. Das US-Fernsehen sendete stundenlang live von hier. Aus Washington war Präsident Clinton gekommen mit vielen Kongressmitgliedern. Alle wollten dabei sein, wenn ein richtiger amerikanischer Held seinen Lebenstraum verwirklicht. 36 Jahre hatte der erste Amerikaner im Weltraum auf diesen zweiten Flug warten müssen. Inzwischen war er Senator in Washington geworden, aber seinen Traum hatte er nie aufgegeben. Als man ihn heute in den Mittelsitz im Shuttle hiefte, war Glenn gelassen, wie immer. Mit 40 Jahren war John Glenn schon beim ersten Ausflug ins All 1962 der älteste der US-Astronauten. Die Erwartung war groß damals, denn die Russen waren den Amerikanern mit Yuri Gagarin als erstem Menschen im Weltraum zuvorgekommen. Die Mercury-Kapsel von Glenn war so klein, dass er sich darin kaum bewegen konnte. Gott gibt dir Geschwindigkeit, John Glenn, wünschte die Bodenstation und beim elften Startversuch klappte endlich alles. Nur vier Stunden und 55 Minuten dauerte das Abenteuer. Präsident Kennedy dekorierte den Helden, der Amerika seinen Stolz zurückgegeben hatte. Die USA im Freudentaumel. Mitten im Kalten Krieg hatte man es den Russen gezeigt. Der Wettlauf zum Mond konnte beginnen. Kein Fitnessprogramm für Senioren war es, das Glenn diesmal überstehen musste. Doch die Ärzte sagten, der 77-Jährige ist topfit. Wie bedient man einen Laptop? Viel Neues musste er lernen, denn seine Raumkapsel hatte damals keinen einzigen Computer. Experimente über das Altern im All, das ist offiziell die Aufgabe der Glenn-Mission. Kritiker sehen das Ganze aber eher als gigantische PR-Aktion der NASA, um mehr Geld für die Raumfahrt in Washington locker zu machen. Der Einstieg ist auch beim Shuttle etwas mühevoll, aber verglichen mit seiner Minikapsel verbringt der Weltraumsenior die nächsten knapp neun Tage schwebend im Luxus-Apartment. Während die Discovery im blauen Himmel über Florida verschwindet, zum letzten Flug vor der Internationalen Raumstation zusammen mit den Russen, kann John Glenn den Ausblick genießen, auf den er so lange gewartet hat. Den Blick zurück auf den blauen Planeten. Mit ein bisschen Verspätung ist heute Abend die amerikanische Raumfähre Discovery in Cape Canaveral gestartet, übrigens bei allerschönstem Wetter. An Bord ist der 77-jährige ehemalige Astronaut John Glenn, der vor mehr als 36 Jahren als erster Amerikaner in den Weltraum geflogen ist. Glenn hat Himmel und Erde bewegt, um noch einmal starten zu dürfen. Und da hat es ihm sicherlich nicht geschadet, dass er demokratischer Senator ist und einer der ganz treuen Freunde von Bill Clinton. Seine Altersreise ist in Amerika nicht unumstritten. Das sei nur ein Werbegag der NASA. Über den alten Mann und das All berichtet Klaus Kleber. Die besten Plätze sind im Morgengrauen schon belegt, wie in den glorreichsten Tagen des amerikanischen Weltraumprogramms. 15 Kilometer von der Startrampe näher darf man ohne Sondererlaubnis nicht ran. Die Generationsgenossen des alternden Weltraumhelden sind gut vertreten, aber nicht unter sich. Auch für Daniel ist John Glenn nicht irgendein Astronaut. Er ist ein richtiger Held. Ich war noch nie bei einem Shuttle-Start, aber für ihn komme ich. In seinem Alter, dazu gehört Mumm. The Right Stuff, der Stoff aus dem Helden sind, hieß ein Film über John Glenn und seine Freunde, die die Nation im Weltraumrennen zum Sieg führen sollten.
Die Kollegen heute könnten zum Teil seine Enkel sein. Er beweist, dass wir Alten alles können, unser Leben genießen, weit reisen, sogar das Shuttle fliegen. Wer die Begeisterung für John Glenn verstehen will, muss wissen, was für ein Held er immer noch ist in Amerika. Die Nation hat ihm nicht vergessen, dass er für sein Land ins All gegangen ist. In einer winzigen Kapsel auf einer Rakete, die nicht endgültig getestet war. Aber die Zeit drängte. Die Sowjetunion hatte großen Vorsprung im Weltraumrennen. Und mit Glenns Flug begann die Aufholjagd. Am Ende war ein Amerikaner der erste Mann auf dem Mond. Nach 30 Jahren Routine NASA hebt heute die glorreiche Zeit noch einmal auf. Und das bringt sogar die Kritiker fast zum Schweigen. Glenns zweiter Flug in den Weltraum hat so viel mit Wissenschaft zu tun wie sein erster. So dient bemannte Weltraumfahrt vor allem der Politik. Aber sie kann immerhin Begeisterung für Wissenschaft wecken. Der Start heute war dazu angetan, trotz einiger Pannen um Computerfehler, ein Flugzeug im Sperrgebiet und eine beschädigte Klappe. Sechs Helden und eine amerikanische Legende auf ihrem Weg in den Weltraum, verkündet die offizielle NASA-Sprecherin. John Glenns Flug ist in der Tat historisch. Die Ära, die er mit seinem Flug vor 36 Jahren begann, geht mit diesem Flug zu Ende. Auf der nächsten Startrampe steht schon das Shuttle Endeavour. In fünf Wochen wird es die ersten Teile für die internationale Raumstation in die Umlaufbahn tragen. Daran erinnernd, dass man für medizinische Versuche häufig Tiere benutzt, sagte John Glenn über seine Funktion bei diesem Weltraumflug. Ich bin bloß der Versuchsaffe. From CNN in Washington, seen live around the world. This is Worldview. I'm Bernard Shaw. And I'm Judy Woodruff. Our top story, one man's journey back to the future. Astronaut John Glenn, the oldest person to travel in space, is returning to the frontier he first explored more than three decades ago. Glenn and six other astronauts aboard the U.S. shuttle Discovery blasted off Thursday from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. CNN's John Zarella is there, and he joins us with more on that story. John. Good evening, Judy. It has been just a long and wondrous day here at the Kennedy Space Center, filled with all kinds of enthusiasm from the 3,500 journalists and members of the media assembled here, all the way over to the tens of thousands, to the hundreds of thousands of people who packed all along the Space Coast, every possible place they could to watch this launch. It was a long day for the astronauts, too. Of course, American hero and legend John Glenn boarded the shuttle Discovery with the other six astronauts at about, uh, oh, two hours before the launch, and uh, he looked awfully spry getting in there for a 77-year-old former senator and now astronaut about to make his second trip into space. The two hours probably went by very, very quickly as they sat there. There were a couple of minor delays uh, during the uh, countdown. The countdown actually 19 minutes late as they waited for clearance of a couple of uh, planes that were in the area and one minor problem. But then when liftoff came, a spectacular moment for everyone and certainly for John Glenn. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Houston Discovery, roll program. Roger, roll, Discovery. While all of this was, of course, taking place, this great moment in American history, President Clinton and his wife Hillary were here at the Kennedy Space Center, and they, of course, watched this liftoff. There they are. They were atop the uh, launch uh, control area here at Kennedy. And uh, to their left there is, of course, uh, NASA Administrator Dan Golden with the cap and the other assembled dignitaries there to see the flight. For, uh, for the president, it was the first time that an American president had come to watch a launch since Richard Nixon watched Apollo 12 here. So a very special moment for all the people here at NASA as well. Now, while the president was watching, unbeknownst to him or anyone else, a problem actually developed just as the vehicle's engines were firing up on the launch pad. A small panel, a panel that you can see right now just above that top engine there, you'll see it coming off. 
There it is. We've isolated it there for you. That is a panel from the drag chute door. It apparently dislodged because of the vibration of the engines. It hit that main engine bell, as they call it, as it fell to the ground. NASA officials uh, took a good hard look and are still taking a good hard look at that. The drag chute has been used on about 40 flights. Primarily, it is used during bad weather situations. Uh, but for the first 50 flights, they never used it. And uh, so it's not believed to be a threatening problem as mission control explained to the astronauts. Houston, go ahead. Yes, Kurt. Uh, just prior to liftoff after main engine start, what appears to be a panel in the vicinity of the drag chute door came off the vehicle and came in contact with the center main engine bell. We are evaluating at this time. We do not expect this to impact your, your mission. If it was a drag chute door, this is not a hazardous condition, and we expect the mission to proceed as scheduled. Again, the uh, mission control, the engineering team here at the Kennedy Space Center and in Houston evaluating the situation, but as you heard, not believed to be a serious situation. The astronauts are on orbit, enjoying their first few hours in orbit, and after they got up there, well, John Glenn got to make his first call home. Hello, Houston. This is PS2. I mean, they let me get sprung out of the mid-deck for a little while. We're just going by Hawaii, and that is absolutely gorgeous. It was certainly absolutely gorgeous for all of us here, too, to watch this spectacular event uh, once in a lifetime by many people's estimations. And uh, for John Glenn, now nine days of experiments on aging in the weightlessness of space. This is John Zarella reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center. Judy? John, just one quick question. Is NASA doing anything particularly different this time because a 77-year-old man is on board, and Senator, for that matter? Not particularly, other than what they did here at the Space Center. The uh, security was absolutely tremendous, unlike anything I had ever seen. Uh, you had uh, armored personnel vehicles, you had bomb-sniffing dogs, men with automatic weapons, things that you never saw. Now, as far as on spa in space, Judy, it's business as usual, and uh, Senator Glenn, former Senator Glenn, is a mission specialist, too, with jobs to perform. Judy? All right, John Zarell, and of course he is a senator until he leaves office, I guess, when his successor is sworn in in January. Thanks. Bernie. During Discovery's mission, 77-year-old Glenn will take part in 10 scientific studies on aging. Some of the effects of weightlessness on the human body are similar to those suffered by the elderly on Earth. NASA scientists say they hope to learn more about balance disorders, bone deterioration, sleep disturbances, cardiovascular problems, and immune response. A great deal has changed, of course, since Glenn's last trip into space. His vehicle in 1962 was a Mercury capsule named Friendship. Now it's the shuttle Discovery. Back then, he made just three orbits around the Earth. This time, he's expected to make 144 orbits. His last flight lasted four hours and 45 minutes. This flight is expected to last eight days and 20 hours. Back then, he traveled more than 75,000 miles. This time, he is expected to cover about 3.6 million miles. Friendship had, believe it or not, no computers. Discovery has five. Except for one tragic accident, the U.S. Space Shuttle program has taken giant strides in America's exploration of space. CNN's Tony Clark takes a look back. We've gone for main engine start. We have main engine start. Since the first launch 17 and a half years ago, the space shuttle program has soared to tremendous heights. And the shuttle has cleared the tower. And it has fallen to cavernous lows. There have been 91 shuttle missions prior to Glenn's flight. Crews have spent a total of 783 days in orbit, performing experiments, launching satellites, retrieving satellites and repairing them. They've practiced building a space station and linked up with the Russian Mir space station to learn what it's like to live and work on one. With the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope in 1990, the shuttle helped astronomers look out into the heavens. And over the years, astronauts have returned to Hubble to give it an even clearer view. While the shuttle has been a workhorse for NASA, 
It has not always lived up to its promise. John Glenn's flight is only the fourth shuttle mission this year. There were twice as many last year. The Spartan satellite was put on Glenn's flight because it failed to operate properly on a mission last year. In 1996, there was an Italian satellite that broke its tether and floated off. A fuel cell problem cut short one mission, and bad weather and woodpeckers have kept the shuttle on the ground. In some respects, the shuttle program has even suffered from its own success. Over the years, public interest has waned as flights seem to become routine. NASA hopes John Glenn will help turn that around. Tony Clark, CNN, Johnson Space Center. Kam kein Raketenstart so viel Aufmerksamkeit wie diese Discovery-Mission. Die ungeteilte Aufmerksamkeit der Menge und der Medien galt diesem Mann, John Glenn. Der zweifache Großvater hat vor 36 Jahren Geschichte geschrieben. An Bord einer Mercury-Kapsel startete er als erster Amerikaner ins All. Zur Zeit des Kalten Krieges feierten die Medien die dreifache Erdumkreisung als historischen Schritt zur Eroberung des Weltraumes. Und John Glenn war der Mann, der für den Aufbruch ins Raketenzeitalter stand. Auch diesmal spielt der älteste Raumfahrer aller Zeiten eine politische Rolle. Er ist das Zugpferd für die Weltraumbehörde NASA beim Kampf um Steuergelder. John Glenn ist wichtig für die amerikanische Öffentlichkeit. Darauf können Sie wetten. Begeisterung und Mythos sind Teil unserer Kultur. Mit Glenn steigt die Zustimmung für unsere Projekte und wir bekommen mehr Geld. Der Veteran soll außerdem eine Vielzahl von Experimenten durchführen. Unter seinem Raumanzug trägt Glenn 70 verschiedene Sensoren. Altersforschung bei Schwerelosigkeit. Zum einen erhoffen sich die Mediziner neue Erkenntnisse zu typischen Alterserscheinungen wie Muskelschwund und Kreislaufbeschwerden. Zum anderen ist dies Grundlagenforschung für Langstreckenflüge. Denn Missionen zum Mars zum Beispiel sind wegen der hohen Strahlung im All gefährlich für die Astronauten. Die Wahrscheinlichkeit einer Krebserkrankung nach der Rückkehr ist sehr hoch. Deshalb werden bei solchen Missionen keine jungen Raumfahrer eingeplant. Meine Eltern haben mir einfach gute Gene vererbt und ich bin in Topform. Über meine Weltalltauglichkeit mache ich mir überhaupt keine Sorgen. Zur siebenköpfigen Crew gehören auch zwei Ärzte. Glenn darf in der Umlaufbahn nicht schlapp machen. Eine Fehlmission würde die amerikanische Öffentlichkeit nicht verzeihen. Oder einzigartig, alles nur, weil ein 77-Jähriger mit an Bord ist. John Glenn, der Unbeugsame, der es schließlich doch noch geschafft hatte, ein zweites Mal ins All vorzustoßen. Es war eine Geschichte wie geschrieben für die Amerikaner. Eine Viertelmillion stand an den Straßen rund um Cape Canaveral, stolz auf den rüstigen Raumfahrer, vor allem die Älteren. I'm very <lacht> ich bin so bewegt, sagt diese Frau unter Tränen. Ich wäre zu gern auch mit dabei, sagt er, aber ich bin zu alt, obwohl ich nicht älter bin als Glenn. Nichts hatte der Großvater gescheut, um seine Fitness unter Beweis zu stellen. Er saß im Cockpit von Kampfflugzeugen, ließ sich wiederholt willig ins Wasser befördern und baumelte fernsehgerecht an Leinen. Ein Mann, für den Gebrechlichkeit offenbar ein Fremdwort ist. Ich bin nicht an Selbstmord interessiert, wischt er alle Zweifel beiseite. Ich will heil zurückkommen, wie alle anderen auch. Die Rolle des Helden hatte Glenn schon bei seinem ersten Flug trefflich ausgefüllt. Als erster Amerikaner stieß er in die Erdumlaufbahn vor, was die Russen schon vor ihm geschafft hatten. Zum Dank bekam er Startverbot. Dem Nationalhelden sollte auf keinen Fall ein Unglück zustoßen. Zur Freude der NASA spielt Glenn den Helden auch heute noch perfekt. Etwas überraschend brach eine wahre Glenn-Manier aus. Der Souvenirshop der NASA wurde zum Dorado für Glenn-Fans aus der ganzen Welt, die sich sorgfältig das richtige Plätzchen ausgesucht hatten. Hier gibt es äh, direkt hinter Cape Canaveral eine Brücke und direkt hinter der Brücke hat man einen super Blick hier zu, diesem, ähm, zu dieser Lounge und dann werden wir unsere ganz Wasser stellen und zugucken. Sogar der Präsident schwebte ein und machte Stimmung für seine NASA, die mit Glens Unterstützung wohl darauf zählen kann, auch in Zukunft die nötigen Budgetmilliarden zu bekommen. Welche Rolle spielt es da schon, dass viele Experten ihre Zweifel haben, ob Glens Selbstversuch im All der Menschheit tatsächlich neue Erkenntnisse über den Prozess des Alterns vermitteln können? Im Grunde genommen spielt der Anbau der Discovery nur eine Nebenrolle. John Glenn, into outer space is the John Glenn ins All zu schicken ist schlechtes Schauspiel, NASA sagt der Raumfahrtexperte Michio Kaku. Das ist Public Relations. Er hat keine klare Mission, da werden erhebliche Summen verschwendet. Doch solche Töne hören die Amerikaner in diesen Tagen gar nicht gerne. John Glenn ist der alte und neue Held, dem die Amerikaner weithin sichtbar nur das Allerbeste wünschen. Mit Ausnahme eines Geschäftsmanns vielleicht, der Glenn eine etwas bizarre Botschaft mit auf den Weg gab. Nimm doch bitte meine Frau mit nach oben. In Cape Canaveral zugeschaltet unser Korrespondent Christoph Lang. Christoph, welche Erkenntnisse verspricht sich die NASA von den Tests mit John Glenn? 
Es geht um das Altern, denn mit Astronauten geschieht in der Schwerelosigkeit etwas Seltsames. Ein Prozess, der etwa mit dem Älterwerden vergleichbar ist. Ihre Muskeln werden zum Beispiel schwächer und ihre Knochen brüchiger. Wenn sie zurück auf der Erde sind, bildet sich das Ganze zurück. Und deshalb möchte die NASA das jetzt mal mit einem alten Mann, also mit John Glenn, untersuchen. Wie sein Herz also in der Schwerelosigkeit reagiert, seine Knochen, seine Muskeln. Die Hoffnung dahinter ist, dass man vielleicht wirklich mal auf eine Idee kommt, wie man das Altern anhalten oder gar rückgängig machen könnte. Was natürlich eine ziemlich vage Hoffnung ist. Und darum sagen so viele Experten, John Glenns Mission sei im Grunde genommen überflüssig und zu teuer. Und was bedeutet die offenbar umstrittene Mission für die US-Raumfahrt? Nun, für die ist es ganz wichtig, dass das Ganze so ein riesiger Erfolg ist, dass John Glenn so derartig populär ist. Denn die NASA braucht Geld, große Projekte stehen an. Schon im nächsten Monat soll ja die, der Zusammenbau der internationalen Raumstation beginnen. Ein Projekt, das in große Frage gestellt worden ist, weil die Russen nicht mehr bezahlen können. Wenn nun alles gut geht hier in dieser Mission mit John Glenn, dann wird der amerikanische Kongress sicher eher geneigt sein, mehr Geld dafür locker zu machen. Und die ersten Stunden, so haben wir gerade noch gehört, hat John Glenn auf jeden Fall gut überstanden. Im Augenblick jedenfalls steht ganz Amerika Kopf. Vielen Dank, Christoph Lang. Nine, eight, we have a go for engine start. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and lift off of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. From CNN's New York headquarters, the Moneyline News Hour with Lou Dobbs. Good evening. America again turned to space with a curiosity and enthusiasm not seen in years. The rocket, larger this time and far more complex. Five onboard computers this time, none last time. And today, the crew compartment carried seven people from three nations instead of one lone American. But just like the Mercury flight of Friendship 7 in 1962, today's launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery carried one John Herschel Glenn, today known as payload specialist number two, back into orbit. Well, standing by now at the Kennedy Space Center is CNN's Miles O'Brien, who covered today's launch. Miles? Lou, you could add one more comparison to that list. Uh, 36 years ago, there were 11 separate delays over three months. This time around, a mere 19 minutes with just a few minor problems to report. We'll get into that in just a few moments. At about three hours and 10 minutes into the mission, John Glenn, with Discovery orbiting over Hawaii, made his first radio call from orbit in 36 years. Hello, Houston, this is PS2. I mean, let me get sprung out of the mid-deck for a little while. We're just going by Hawaii, and that is absolutely gorgeous. Hey, Roger that. Glad you're enjoying the show. Boy, enjoying the show is right. This is beautiful. The best part is that uh, do a trite old statement, zero G, and I feel fine. Zero G and I'll five, fee I feel fine. Four, An echo of 36 three, years ago three, on that mission. One. Discovery lifted off and rocketed into a flawlessly clear blue sky about 19 minutes after the launch window opened up, 2 p.m. Eastern time. One slight delay came from a faulty sensor reading. Another when a private plane strayed into the no-fly zone around the Kennedy Space Center. Among the 7,000 invited VIPs and 3,700 media types here at the Cape, President and Mrs. Clinton, who watched with the aid of binoculars. Now, there is the minor problem that we told you about at the top. The drag chute door at the back of the shuttle, right above the middle engine, as you see here in isolation, fell off just as Discovery lifted off the pad. The ground controllers here in Florida say it should not adversely impact the mission. The purpose of the drag chute is to assist us in slowing the vehicle and in crosswind landing capability. Uh, we flew the first 50 missions of the Space Shuttle program, or I should say the first mission where we flew a drag chute was STS-50, and we obviously can successfully land the Space Shuttle without the drag chutes. It is possible to land a shuttle without a drag chute. In fact, the first 50 shuttle missions flew without them entirely. So if, in fact, that drag chute doesn't deploy, NASA says it's no problem. It just means the shuttle might roll one or 2,000 extra feet down the shuttle landing facility runway or Edwards Air Force Base, as the case may be, depending on where the shuttle finally lands. Right now, the shuttle is in its third orbit over the Indian Ocean, approaching Australia. And in a little less than an hour, 
John Glenn will double his log time in space. Lou? Miles, thank you. Miles O'Brien reporting from Cape Canaveral, where he and uh, Walter Cronkite did a splendid job uh, covering the launch today of Space Shuttle Discovery. Today's shuttle flight created a moment that seemed to go back to another time. People gathered together around television sets and schools and offices in public spaces such as Times Square in New York City. People stopped and they looked. And in downtown Chicago this afternoon, it was very much the same story. At the site itself, Cape Canaveral, one of the largest crowds ever assembled to watch a space launch. Mark Potter reports from Titusville. And to arrive in the pre-dawn hours, hoping to get the best seats for liftoff later in the afternoon. One benefit of arriving so early is that the sunrise was as spectacular as the weather for launch that followed. As the morning unfolded, several hundred thousand people from around the country and the world crowded the beaches, roads, causeways, even the fishing piers to get the best glimpse of history in the making. Everyone had their reasons for being here, and for most, it was to see John Glenn return to space. John is getting everybody all excited again about going up to space, and that's what NASA's whole program needed. Lillian Edwards came all the way from Rockford, Illinois, and arrived at a park in Titusville at 6 a.m. to get a front row seat. She said the country has found a much needed hero in John Glenn. You know, the country is so sick of hearing about Monica, and now we have, we can raise our head to the skies. Among the crowd was a man with an interesting name. My name is John Glenn. You're kidding. No, I'm not. He wasn't kidding. It said so on his credit cards and driver's license. As the time for launch approached, the excitement built. Finally, the delays passed, and the count toward launch wound down. As Discovery reached for the sky, the crowds erupted. sitting here all day wondering why I got up at 5 in the morning to be here and it just all paid off. I was I was very tense. <laughs> I was very tense. I just I just wanted it to go smoothly. I just wanted to sail away and it did. When it takes off it brings tears to your eyes and, and tell me why. I guess it just makes you proud to be an American. That's the way many felt here. Mark Potter, CNN, Titusville, Florida. Today's cheering crowds took little notice of Glenn's accomplished crewmates or even the commander of the shuttle. His name is a complete mystery to most. The Moneyline briefing book shows that his name is Curtis Brown Jr. He is an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who has logged 977 hours in space during more than a decade as an astronaut. Pilot Stephen Lindsay, also an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, he holds a master's degree in aeronautical engineering and is making his second space flight. And Scott uh, Parazinski, an emergency medical specialist who graduated with honors from Stanford University Medical School in 1989. He trained as backup crewman for the Russian space station Mir, but was scrubbed. He is too tall. And Stephen Robinson is also a Stanford grad with a doctorate in mechanical engineering. He's in charge of shuttle research. And Pedro Duque, uh, who is nicknamed Juan Glenn by his colleagues, is the first Spaniard in space. At 35, this aeronautical engineer is the youngest person on board. And Chiaki Muki is a heart surgeon with a PhD in physiology, the first Japanese woman in space. She sits beside Glenn at takeoff and landing. Well, to give you an idea of how spaceflight and the coverage of spaceflight has changed since John Glenn's last mission, we have a film using a compilation of NASA footage. During that flight, there was real fear that Glenn's capsule might burn up on re-entry because mysterious particles that Glenn spotted outside the capsule were thought to be elements of his heat shield disintegrating. And one more note, some of the pictures you're about to see are from a film camera inside the capsule, which was returned to Earth and then developed later. Back in 1962, there was no way to beam live pictures from space to Earth. Here is a look at those tense moments now from the launch to worries about the heat shield to the lack of communication during what seemed like the endless period of blacked out communication before Friendship 7 reappeared. Godspeed, John Glenn. Oh, that view is tremendous. Yeah, I still have some of the 
these particles that I cannot identify coming around the capsule occasionally, over. Uh, Roger, how big are these particles? Over. Uh, very small. I would indicate they're of the order of a sixteenth of an inch or smaller. Uh, they drift by the window, and uh, I can see them against the dark sky. Uh, just as it, just at sunrise, there were literally thousands of them. It looked like just a myriad of stars. Over. This is Texas Capcom Fraction 7. We are recommending that you leave the retro package on through the entire re-entry. This also means that you will have to manually retract the scope. Do you read? Uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. Not at this time. This is the judgment of Cape Flight. Uh, Go ahead, Cape Friend 7. I recommend you go to the entry attitude and retract the scope manually at this time. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Over. Uh, roger. Understand. Uh, this is Friendship 7. I think the uh, pack just let go. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape. Do you read? This is Friendship 7, a real fireball outside. Okay, Friendship 7, over. Uh, 7, this is Cape. Do you read, over? Keep talking, Al. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape, over. Uh, Friendship 7, this is Cape. How do you read, over? Oh, uh, Roger. Reading it loud and clear. How you doing? My condition is good, but that was a real fireball, boy. On the morning of February 21st, 1962, a banner headline and half a dozen stories covered the front page of the New York Times trumpeting Glenn's historic flight. But there were other stories that made page one that day. West German Chancellor Konrad Adenauer calling for a conference on Berlin, the city the Soviets divided with a wall just six months earlier. New York Governor Nelson Rockefeller denying a bonus to Korean War veterans. He argued the state needed more funds for education, mental health and narcotics control and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara reporting improvement in South Vietnam's efforts against communist guerrillas. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. John Glenn began this first phase of our space program, and he's, he's ending it uh, just before we start on the space station. It's been 36 years since John uh, flew his last flight. This is his second one. He's going to have a new experience with this one. Welcome aboard, John Glenn. Roger. Thank you, my sure you last there also. It is that day of vu between four and a half hours, 36 years ago, and now. Godspeed, John Glenn. Hello, I'm Miles O'Brien, reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center. Walter Cronkite at my side. We've had a remarkable day here today, a spectacular day, a picture-perfect day. NASA couldn't have scripted it any better, could they? Have? Absolutely not. This this one this one was the the perfect example of how you how you launch a shuttle. Absolutely. Yeah. We're about five hours and forty minutes into the mission. Thirty-six years after he first orbited the planet. There we go. Five hours forty-one minutes, forty-six seconds to be exact. John Glenn is orbiting the Earth once again. And about a little less than an hour ago, 45 minutes ago, at the 4 hour, 55 minute and 23 second mark, which was the time of his first flight, Commander Kurt Brown had a few words for his payload specialist. I just want the record to show that uh, we just passed 4 hours, 55 minutes and 23 seconds. And uh, I promised I'd take Senator Glenn on uh, his second flight and make it a little bit longer than his first flight. And we've already accomplished that. So we... Uh, a bunch of smiling faces up here. And Roger that. Congratulations to the senator for uh, doubling his space flight hours. Kurt's a man of his word. I'm now doubled on my space time and building up every second here. Thanks a lot. Doubled his space time, building up every second. Well, one of the questions uh, to be asked on this mission was how 
Glenn at 77 years old instead of 40 years old could stand a much longer period of weightlessness. Uh, we haven't found out very much yet, but so far he's doing fine. Well, I think he said those famous words once again, zero G and feeling fine, and yeah. I'm sure he'll give us a nice running commentary. He was marveling at the uh, beautiful sight of Hawaii as they came over it, and he would, and th that mission 36 years ago, he talked almost all the way around the globe, didn't he? Yep, and, uh, and of course he didn't see an awful lot. He, uh, he was concentrating on, on actually flying the spacecraft a lot of the time, which he hadn't really expected to do. And, uh, uh, and uh, he said about this flight, what he's really looking to is getting a good look at Earth from up there. He deserves a chance to see the view. Well, of course, the action now shifts from uh, Florida to Houston, which is where the shuttle missions are controlled, where most of the, certainly the Apollo missions, the Gemini missions, and the latter part of the Mercury program was controlled. And that is where we find CNN's Tony Clark, who is at the Mission Control Center. Tony, what's going on there now? Well, you know, it, it's really quiet right now, and I think that's probably a reflection of, of how smoothly this launch has gone today and the mission has gone so far. In fact, uh, aside from a, there was a problem with a leaky pipe in the drinking uh, water uh, facility there on the shuttle. The only other problem that has been of any concern was right at the time of liftoff when uh, a drag chute door appeared to fall off. In fact, if we take a look at the, the launch, you can see just as the engines fire up, you can see the, uh, the door fall down and hit what appears to be the main engine bell. And the uh, officials, uh, both at the Kennedy Space Center or here at the Johnson Space Center and also the contractor, have been studying the, uh, the problem to see exactly what effect that might be. If we take a look at the landing from the, uh, the last shuttle, STS-91, you can see as it lands, you can see the door pop off and the uh, drag chute the pop system. out, and that gives you some idea of, of what we're talking about here. So far, officials here say that they don't foresee that to be any kind of a problem. They're still continuing to, uh, to study that now to, to see if anything needs to be done. But at this point, they have told the crew of the shuttle that they don't expect it to uh, cause any problem either in the, uh, the mission itself or in landing. But they're continuing to take a look at it. Here at Mission Control, it's been quiet uh, throughout uh, much of the evening as the shuttle crew has gone about starting up various experiments, getting things stowed away, getting set for their nine days in orbit. In fact, a little while ago, they brought pizza in here to the uh, mission controllers, and so you can kind of get a, an idea that things are uh, getting into the a rhythm uh, that they expect to last for the entire nine days. So a good start for what everyone hopes will be a, a very good mission. Miles? Tony, I guess it's worth pointing out here that the shuttle program flew 46 missions without ever even having a drag chute. Uh, so clearly the shuttle can land without one, perhaps roll another 1,000 or maybe 2,000 feet. But at yeah. this juncture, is there any contemplation to an alternate landing site or anything like that? Well, you know, there was some talk. I, t I talked to one of the engineers here, and he said, you know, they they have the option of Edwards Air Force Base, the dry lake bed there that gives them a, a very wide area uh, for the, the landing. And so that's a, an option. But, you know, one of the things what the, the NASA engineers are looking at now is really what is the condition of the drag chute area what effect will there be of, uh, to it of being in orbit and also uh, the, the landing? And, and those are the uh, scenarios that they're looking at right now to see what, what may happen to it. And uh, they say that you know, at this point they don't think that's a problem at all. All right. Well, it, it should be considered, I think, by, I guess you agree, Tony, that uh, the runway here is one of the longest runways in the world, 15,000 feet here at the Kennedy Space Center. But they've got a seven and a half mile strip out there at Edwards and that uh, long lake bed, a lot of overrun possibilities, uh, and it's wider. Uh, if there thought, was any thought that they might have a, possi a possible problem in landing, uh, it would seem that Edwards might be the choice. Absolutely. All right. Um, I talked to a, uh, just a little while ago, I talked to one of the NASA people who works in the engine office here, and I asked him if there was some concern that that uh, door in hitting that engine bell could have caused a leak, and would that leak have caused a problem? He said, believe it or not, leaks on those engines are self-sealing. It's so hot and there's coolant running down the outside that it actually seals itself, and it might have caused, if there was a leak, perhaps a little loss of performance, but nothing uh, on the order of a solid rocket booster leak, which, of course, as we know, led to the challenge. <laughs> That's it, Bill. 
All right. Well, CNX John Zarella was joining us all day today. He was out and about uh, amongst the crowd, enjoying the spectacle along with the rest of us. And he has a good recap for us of the events as Discovery lofted into orbit. After waiting 36 years, John Glenn's dream to return to space has come true. Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. In 1962, Glenn left Earth in a capsule built for one. Thursday, he left Earth in a space plane with six other astronauts. No event in U.S. space history since the launch of Apollo 11 to the moon has captured so much attention. Glenn's wife and family watched liftoff from a private viewing area. The president and Mrs. Clinton were here, too. A chorus of cheers went up from the hundreds of thousands of people who packed every single you-can-see-it-from-here spot on the Space Coast. I think it was going to affect me like it did, but it was really, really, it was just something you have to see. I don't think you can watch it. I don't think TV does it justice. It was really emotional. It gave me goosebumps. The scheduled 2 p.m. launch was delayed 19 minutes by minor issues. One with the spacecraft. The second, when unauthorized planes had to be cleared from the airspace. Nine. For NASA, the near-perfect countdown brought well-dones for the shuttle team from the first president since Nixon to be on hand for a space launch. We had confidence in you and pride in America and a conviction that our space program is good for the United States and good for the world. Nine. While the countdown was near perfect, a on liftoff, a panel that covers Five. the landing drag Four. chute fell off Three. just as the vehicle's engines fired up. We are evaluating at this time. We do not expect this to impact your, your mission. If it was a drag chute door, this is not a hazardous condition, and we expect the mission to proceed as scheduled. Glenn and the crew began their day with the traditional early morning breakfast photo opportunity. A couple hours later, with spacesuits on, they waved as they left for the launch pad and their appointment with history. Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter added another chapter to the history books with a variation on his immortalized words uttered first on February 20th, 1962. Good luck. Have a safe flight. And to say once again, Godspeed. John Glenn. John Zarella, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. You know, uh, looking at these pictures, Walter, this may be a little bit of inside baseball, but I'm amazed at the quality of photography and how it has improved since the first shots you did. Absolutely unbelievable looking at those boosters, uh, uh, at separation of the boosters, the continuing firing of the boosters. At that, uh, They were, uh, what, 60 almost miles up at that point. Yes. It's incredible. And it's, it's quite a spectacular sight to see them lazily tumbling over like a lit cigarette there in the yeah, sky. Right. All right. When we come up, we're going to take a break. When we uh, come back, the president, of course, was here. And uh, he had a chance to take in his first shuttle launch. And uh, just on a personal note, uh, I've had a fun day. I know you have had a fun day. And, oh, it's been um, great. I would gladly trade it for the opportunity to watch John Holloman be here. And yeah. uh, our broadcast today, all throughout the day, is devoted to his memory. We'll be back in a moment. Two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Houston Discovery, roll program. Roger, roll, Discovery. U.S. astronaut John Glenn made history when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. Godspeed, John Glenn. Now he is set to make history once again by becoming the oldest person ever to travel into space. CNN takes a look at his journey with live coverage of the shuttle launch, select editions of Q&A and Insight, and a series of special reports highlighting this historic mission. John Glenn's return to space throughout the day, only on CNN. On CNN's Global View, four years ago, the horror of genocide... There were 3,700 members of the media here, we're told by NASA, 7,000 invited VIPs, perhaps a couple of hundred thousand people along the beaches of the Space Coast. Uh, it was uh, quite a scene, sort of reminiscent of the moonshots, wasn't it? 
Very much so. I, uh, those who, who live here and spent all their time here following all these shuttle flights before uh, really were taken back to the days of the moon flights by the crowds. There hadn't been anything like this since the, the last moon flight, really. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it gives all of them heart here because they live with the space program. They, 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 they want it to be a popular thing and to see the crowds coming back, see those campers on all the highways around here, uh, setting up their locations two and three days in advance to be in uh, a good view of the, of the launch. Uh, that, that must be very heartening to the folks of uh, Cocoa Beach and the surrounding area. Of course, the last time uh, President of the United States came to a rocket launch here at the Cape, it was Apollo 12, it was 1969, and the President was Richard Nixon. They promptly launched that rocket into a thunderstorm. No problems along those lines today. Certainly, the First Lady and the President here in attendance to witness this launch. Uh, we're told the First Lady at one time inquired about becoming an astronaut and was pretty much flatly rebuffed by NASA at the time. Women need not apply. Anyway, the President and the First Lady were here. CNN's Carl Rochelle tells us about their events. It was an emotional moment for President Clinton and the First Lady as they watched the shuttle launch of Senator Glenn from the right roof of the Launch Henry. Control Center at the Kennedy Space Center. He told CNN before the launch he was a little nervous, but not for Glenn's safety. Those who work on the ground, those who plan these missions, uh, they've done everything they can possibly do, and they would never compromise uh, an iota of safety or reliability just because uh, Hillary and I and all the rest of the world are here through the media. Uh, I feel good about this, but yes, I'm nervous and I'm excited. I feel like a, a kid at his first Christmas. I'm very excited about this. Even though there have been nearly 100 space shuttle launches, President Clinton is the first sitting U.S. president to watch one in person. With John Glenn and the Discovery crew safely on their way into orbit, the president and Mrs. Clinton went below to launch control, where the president told controllers this trip helped fulfill one of the first lady's wishes. About a year ago, she said, you know, we need to make a list of all the things we want to do before we leave office. And I said, okay, what's on your list? She said, you have to take me to a space launch. I want to go. The only other president to come to the Cape for a launch was President Richard Nixon in 1969 for Apollo 12, one of the moon missions. NASA has been struggling to achieve the level of public support that it had during the days of the moon launches and the first shuttles. Even though President Clinton has declared his continued support, the space agency's budget has remained about the same since he took office. The White House says it hasn't gone up because NASA is more efficient now and able to do more with less. Carl Rochelle, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center. Walter, that uh, on the point of the NASA budgets, the NASA budgets being flat or when adjusted probably for inflation, uh, diminishing, uh, the fact remains, in the absence of a space race, NASA has a difficult time selling the program in Congress. Sure. sure. Uh, we had a space race with a very powerful Russia, Soviet Union at that time, uh, a challenge to our security, as a matter of fact, the development of high-powered uh, rockets that would, could also launch missiles as well as men in space, the possibility of uh, surveillance from above, controlling space, as it were. All these things in the light of the Cold War were very important to us. It's much more difficult today, obviously, to sell people on the huge expenditures that it takes to run an operation like this. These, these launches cost somewhere around a half a uh, billion dollars each, around 500 million dollars a launch. That's a lot of money. You can build an awful lot of schools for that. You can give the Coast Guard a lot more money to defend our coasts against the incursion of drugs. You can uh, do a lot for the environment for the 500 million dollars that each of these missions cost. And the beginning of the construction of the next big project in space, the uh, space uh, uh, station out there, uh, the permanent station, uh, was pretty, changeable population, uh, that, that's going to cost even more, particularly now that the Russians probably cannot do their part uh, of that mission because of their economic crisis. So uh, the, it's a constant battle to justify uh, these expenditures. Uh, uh, those who support them certainly believe that man will be going to space, must be going to space. We want to maintain our leadership in that, uh, in that uh, effort. Uh, and it's the adventure of the 21st century, certainly, uh, to get out there and to populate space. So uh, 
Uh, I think we're going to continue to do it. I think the American public probably will support it, but the, there will be constant consideration of the immense cost and the place that it has in our priority of expenditures. I suppose uh, you, could, you could draw a lesson from this, that the American public genuinely responds to the adventure of humans in space, because this is what this is all about. And certainly if you were to take, uh, use as your judge the number of people who turned out on the causeways and beaches all around the Space Coast today to witness this launch, you would say this program would sell in Congress. CNN's Mark Potter was with the folks in the Winnebago's all day long. But a the spectators began to arrive in the pre-dawn hours, hoping to get the best seats for liftoff later in the afternoon. One benefit of arriving so early is that the sunrise was as spectacular as the weather for launch that followed. As the morning unfolded, several hundred thousand people from around the country and the world crowded the beaches, roads, causeways, even the fishing piers to get the best glimpse of history in the making. Everyone had their reasons for being here, and for most, it was to see John Glenn return to space. John is getting everybody all excited again about going up to space, and that's what NASA's whole program needed. Lillian Edwards came all the way from Rockford, Illinois, and arrived at a park in Titusville at 6 a.m. to get a front row seat. She said the country has found a much needed hero in John Glenn. You know, the country is so sick of hearing about Monica. And now we have, we can raise our head to the skies. Among the crowd was a man with an interesting name. My name is John Glenn. You're kidding. No, I'm not. He wasn't kidding. It said so on his credit cards and driver's license. As the time for launch approached, the excitement built. Finally, the delays passed and the count toward launch wound down. As Discovery reached for the sky, the crowds erupted. You know, I've been sitting here all day wondering why I got up at 5 in the morning to be here, and it just all paid off. I was, I was very tense. <laughs> I was very tense. I just, I just wanted it to go smoothly. I just wanted to, to sail away, and it did. When it takes off, it brings tears to your eyes. And, and tell me why. I guess it just makes you proud to be an American. That's the way many felt here. Mark Potter, CNN, Titusville, Florida. Of course, as Walter pointed out, it is a bit of preaching to the choir here in the Space Coast. we got to take a break. When we come back, recognize this cover, Life magazine from, uh, let's see, it must be 1962. Yeah, February 2nd, 1962. Now check out this one from a recent edition. I don't know the exact date on this one. Ralph Morris is the photographer in both cases. He'll be our guest when we return. Stay with us. It's been a very nostalgic day here at the Kennedy Space Center. 3,700 members of the media here to cover the return of John Glenn to space, an historic moment, a moment of adventure, a moment of some emotion. CNN's Jim Murray took a look at all the people covering this story. When Sputnik shot into orbit in 1957, it did more than simply launch the space race. Covering the space program became the newest frontier for the young television networks. News coverage is the faucet by which the public gets to see the space program. The interest in the space program is probably a combination of television and our own curiosity and fantasies about what it'd be like to go into space, to be on the moon. And NASA's footage fueled those fantasies. Godspeed, John Glenn. In 1962, John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth aboard the Friendship 7 Mercury spacecraft. I was in the back of a station wagon out in that marsh that is Cape Canaveral, uh, mosquitoes buzzing about my head, rattlesnakes rattling around at my feet. <laughs> it wasn't exactly pleasant nor very efficient, uh, it, it's, uh, but it wasn't any more primitive than the missile and the spacecraft that took Glenn into flight. Seven years later, Apollo 11 went to the moon, and Neil Armstrong literally walked into history. That's one small step for man, 
It's one of those few things that can unite a country in terms of watching something and sharing an experience. The final lunar landing was in 1972. Perhaps the novelty began to fade. As space travel became almost predictable, viewers became complacent at the prospect of another routine launch. NASA sort of suffered from its own success. The flights have been so successful over the last couple of decades that we don't pay any attention to them anymore. In this cynical day and age, we only care when it goes as unexpected. It went tragically awry in 1986 when the shuttle Challenger exploded, killing all seven astronauts aboard. The media coverage didn't tend to put it in the context of, well, this was a risky business, and it's to be expected that when you test exotic experimental aircraft and spacecraft, people are going to get killed. NASA has launched 65 shuttle flights since then. Now John Glenn returns to space 36 years after his first flight. I think the flight is important. I think it's refocusing our attention, at least momentarily, on space flight, on the flights of the shuttles. Jim Moray, CNN, Los Angeles. Jetzt ist er der älteste Mensch, der jemals im All war. Am Abend startete der 77-Jährige mit der US-Raumfähre Discovery. Dabei gab es allerdings eine Panne. Nur wenige Sekunden vor dem Abheben verlor die Raumfähre die Abdeckung des Bremsfallschirms. Die Mission ist deswegen aber nicht in Gefahr. Die Raumfähre könne auch ohne diesen Fallschirm problemlos landen, teilte die NASA mit. 70-jährigen Weltraumveteranen John Glenn im All, hier zwischen zwei weiteren Astronauten an Bord der Discovery. Er hatte vor 36 Jahren als erster Amerikaner in einem Raumschiff die Erde umkreist. Am Beispiel Glenns will die NASA die Auswirkungen der Schwerelosigkeit auf alte Menschen untersuchen. Außer Glenn sind vier weitere Amerikaner, ein Spanier und eine Japanerin an Bord. Der älteste Astronaut der Welt ist im All. John Glenn hatte lange darum gekämpft, noch einmal zu den Sternen fliegen zu dürfen. Am Abend war es soweit. Um 20.19 Uhr unserer Zeit hob die US-Raumfähre Discovery von Cape Canaveral ab. An Bord Raumfahrtlegende John Glenn und sechs weitere Astronauten. Hunderttausende sahen zu, sie waren hauptsächlich wegen des Seniors gekommen. Glenn hatte vor 36 Jahren als erster Amerikaner schon einmal die Erde umkreist. 17 minutes past the hour. Well, the space shuttle Discovery has blasted into orbit once again on a science mission that is anything but routine. The first American to orbit the Earth is aboard 36 years after his first historic flight. CNN's John Zarella reports on the liftoff that even the President of the United States didn't want to miss. After waiting 36 years, John Glenn's dream to return to space has come true. Four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. In 1962, Glenn left Earth in a capsule built for one. Thursday, he left Earth in a space plane with six other astronauts. No event in U.S. space history since the launch of Apollo 11 to the moon has captured so much attention. Glenn's wife and family watched liftoff from a private viewing area. The president and Mrs. Clinton were here, too. A chorus of cheers went up from the hundreds of thousands of people who packed every single you-can-see-it-from-here spot on the Space Coast. I think it was going to affect me like it did, but it was really, really, it was just something you have to see. I don't think you can watch it. I don't think TV does it justice. It was really emotional. It gave me goosebumps. The scheduled 2 p.m. launch was delayed 19 minutes by minor Two issues. One with the spacecraft. The second when unauthorized planes had to be cleared from 10, the airspace. Nine. For NASA, the near-perfect countdown brought well-dones for the shuttle team from the first president since Nixon to be on hand for a space launch. We had confidence in you and pride in America and a conviction that our space program is good for the United States and good for the world. Nine, While the countdown eight, was near perfect, on liftoff, a panel that covers Five, the landing drag four, chute fell off three, just as two, the vehicle's engines four. fired up. We are evaluating at this time. We do not expect this to impact your, your mission. If it was a drag chute door, this is not a hazardous condition, and we expect the mission to proceed as scheduled. Glenn and the crew began their day with the traditional early morning breakfast photo opportunity. A couple hours later, with spacesuits on, they waved as they left for the launch pad and their appointment with history. 
Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter added yes, another uh, chapter to the history books with a variation on his immortalized so words uttered first on February 20th, 1962. Good luck. Have a safe flight. And to say once again, Godspeed, John Glenn. John Zarella, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center. Immer das Tages heute und seit etwas mehr als zwölf Stunden ist er da oben irgendwo. John Glenn, der älteste Astronaut der Welt. Er ist 77 Jahre alt und Sie haben es gerade gehört, er flog als erster Mann einmal um die Erde. Das war 1962. Und jetzt ist er da oben und wir zeigen Ihnen mal, was er sieht, wenn er runterschaut. So sieht Herr Ewald, was sieht so aus? Das ist äh, das Space Shuttle Discovery kurz nach dem Start. Und nach geglücktem Start können die Astronauten dann auch ihre Helme lösen, ist die Sitze die Erde? verstauen und dann aus den Fenster schauen. Das ist die Erde aus äh, ca. 500 Kilometer Höhe. Da sieht man gerade Daumen hoch, alles hat geklappt, obwohl etwas verspätet ging es los, 19 Minuten. Ja, aber ohne technische Probleme, das war zur Abklärung von verschiedenen Sachen noch als äh, geplanter Halt eigentlich. Und jetzt äh, läuft die Mission, soweit man es erfährt, nominal. Ja, und dieser Fachkommentator, den Sie gerade schon gehört haben, können Sie jetzt auch sehen, das ist Reinhold Ewald, deutscher Astronaut und Sie waren auch schon mal im All. Das ist jetzt anderthalb Jahre her, Sie waren damals auf der Mir, der russischen Raumstation. Was ist das Faszinierende am Weltraum? Die ersten Sekunden, nachdem die Raketen abgestellt sind, das ist schon die Überraschung eigentlich, auf die man keinen vorbereiten kann. Auf der Erde können wir diese Schwerelosigkeit nur für einige Sekunden in Flugzeugen zum Beispiel erleben. Aber dieser andauernde Zustand, den John Glenn jetzt auch erstmals richtig genießen kann, denn bei seinen Erdumkreisungen vor äh, dieser langen Zeit, da war er festgeschnallt in einer ganz engen Kapsel. Die, diese Schwerelosigkeit, die merkt man erst richtig in den ersten Orbits. Man wird immer mutiger, man versucht sich in Akrobatik vielleicht und auch mit dem Blick auf die Erde. Und die Erde, sieht die so faszinierend aus? Oder ist es ein weißer Ball oder sieht man Farben? Was kann man erkennen? Aus der Höhe, die äh, dieses äh, Space Shuttle fliegt und auch äh, aus der Höhe der Meerraumstation sieht man Ausschnitte der Erde. Faszinierende Ausschnitte der Erde, immer auch wieder den dünnen Rand der Atmosphäre, der dann ins schwarzes Als übergeht. Man sieht also nicht wie im Wettersatellit die ganze Kugel und dann kommt aber auch schon gleich das Interesse, was sehe ich denn da unten? Das ist wie ein Atlas, der unter einem durchgezogen wird. John Glenn ist der älteste Mann jetzt im All. Er ist 77 Jahre alt und er soll Experimente zur Schwerelosigkeit im Alter machen. Es gibt auch Kritik, dass er überhaupt geflogen ist, obwohl er eine amerikanische Legende ist. Und wir sagen Ihnen jetzt, worauf sich die Kritik gründet. Dem alten Astronauten wird die letzte Mission seiner Karriere nicht im Anzug stecken bleiben. Der Held aus den ersten Tagen des Weltraumrennens sieht sich nicht als Symbol und nicht als Tourist, sondern als legitimes Mitglied des Teams, das seinen Platz an Bord hart verdient hat. Es gibt mindestens neun Gebiete, auf denen Schwerelosigkeit ähnlichen Effekt hat wie das Altern auf der Erde. Kombiniert man beides wie bei mir, kann man Erkenntnisse gewinnen über Knochenschwund, Kreislaufprobleme, orthopädischen Verfall und so weiter. Der Weltraumspezialist der amerikanischen Wissenschaftlervereinigung sieht den ganzen medizinischen Aufwand mit freundlicher Skepsis. John Glenns zweiter Weltraumflug hat so viel mit Wissenschaft zu tun wie sein erster, nämlich wenig. Es geht um Politik, um nationale Begeisterung und um Werbung für das Weltraumprogramm. John Glenn ficht das alles nicht an. Sein Renommee und sein persönlicher Mut bringen der NASA, was ihr heute mehr fehlt als wissenschaftliche Daten. Weltraumbegeisterung, wie es sie seit fast 30 Jahren nicht mehr gegeben hat. Er hat eine Ära begonnen und bringt sie nun zu Ende. Wenn Glenn landet, beginnen wir mit unseren Partnern, die internationale Raumstation. Die Weltraumbegeisterung, das ist unser Thema des Tages heute und Reinhold Ewald ist im Studio. Wir haben gerade gehört, es gibt Kritik an der Mission von John Glenn, 77 Jahre, ist er alt und ist nochmal mitgeflogen. Was würden Sie sagen, sind die Erkenntnisse, die wissenschaftlichen Erkenntnisse, die John Glenn dort machen kann, sinnvoll und sind sie notwendig oder ist das Ganze wirklich nur ein PR-Trick der amerikanischen Raumfahrt? Es ist tatsächlich so, dass die Forschung dessen, was unter Schwerelosigkeit mit dem Menschen passiert, sehr interessante Parallelen auf der Erde auch hat, Gerade auch äh, zu Beschwerden, sagen wir mal, die alte Menschen haben durch äh, Hormonwechsel, durch äh, ähnliches, ich sag mal Knochen- und Muskelschwund. Ganz typisch auch für junge Leute im All. Und man möchte die Statistik natürlich so haben, dass man über alle Altersklassen auch Punkte hat. Manchmal braucht es aber natürlich auch eine prominente Figur, 
um diese Art Forschung dann auch mit der Person festzumachen. Da ist John Glenn natürlich die Idealbesetzung als amerikanische Legende, wie es da gesagt wurde. Was macht ihn denn zu einer solchen Legende? Weil er der Erste Sein war? Mut, 1962, mhm. als einer dieser sieben Erstastronauten in Amerika den äh, russischen Vorflug, Yuri Gagarin war ja der Erste im All, zu konterkarieren, auch Amerika damit ins All zu bringen, das war damals ja keine leichte Sache. Er ist mit mehrfacher Erdbeschleunigung ins All geschossen worden. Heute die Space Shuttle sind etwas äh, milder in dieser Art. Und das hat angehalten, das hat mit der Konfettiparade und durch all die Zeit angehalten, aber er hat sich auch fit gehalten für dieses neue Ziel, noch mal ins All zurückzukehren. Also würden Sie sagen, diese Mission erfüllt zwei Zwecke, wissenschaftliche und technische und natürlich auch ein bisschen Werbezwecke für die ja teure Raumfahrt? Werbezwecke insofern, als gezeigt wird, mit nur dem Willen, das zu tun, kann man auch so etwas erreichen und mit dem Namen natürlich John Glenn. Das ist jetzt kein Beispiel ja. für alle 77-Jährigen, die sich vielleicht ausrechnen, <lacht> den nächsten Urlaub im All zu verbringen. Würden Sie denn noch mal abheben in dem Alter? Ich hoffe, ich hebe vorher noch mal ab, bevor ja. ich also 77 werde. Und das kann äh, zusammenhängen mit der internationalen Raumstation, die da angesprochen wurde. Denn äh, wir Europäer bilden ja auch ein Team von Astronauten aus äh, den Mitgliedstaaten der ESA, das an Bord der Raumstationen arbeiten soll. Und wir sollten nicht vergessen, dass der Kollege Pedro Ducke aus Spanien, ein ESA-Astronaut, mit an Bord ist, seinen ersten Europäer. Flug macht und da auch schon Erfahrungen ja. sammelt, die er dann natürlich später auch in der Internationalen Raumstation verwirklichen kann. Reinhold Ewald, diese Internationale Raumstation, die wird in drei Wochen wird das erste Modul hochgeschossen, die soll 2002 fertig sein und wir zeigen Ihnen mal, wie es dann da oben im All aussieht. Der Vorstoß in neue Dimensionen ist vor allem ein Vorstoß in eine neue Preisklasse. 180 Milliarden Mark soll die Raumstation ISS verschlingen. Eine gigantische Summe, die zur Zusammenarbeit zwingt. Die USA, Russland, die Europäische Union, Japan und Kanada wollen die International Space Station bis 2003 gemeinsam im All zusammenbauen. Das Labor bietet so viel Platz wie zwei Jumbo Jets zusammen. Es soll die Forschung auf der Erde weiterbringen. In ständiger Schwerelosigkeit, hier ein früherer Flug, sollen sechs bis sieben Astronauten vom Boden aus medizinisch betreut werden. So will man die Fahnenbehandlung perfektionieren, die sogenannte Telemedizin. Bis jetzt sind solche Experimente nur nach jahrelanger Wartezeit möglich. Industrie und öffentliche Stellen sollen von der Station gemeinsam profitieren. Kritiker bezweifeln aber den wissenschaftlichen Nutzen der ISS. Außerdem liefen die Kosten davon. Das verzögert die Fertigstellung, gleichzeitig produziert jeder Zeitverlust neue Kosten. Schon in drei Wochen aber soll das erste Teilstück starten. Dann gibt es einen nahezu regelmäßigen Shuttle-Service. Denn die ISS wird nicht nur aus wissenschaftlichen, sondern auch aus politischen Gründen vorangetrieben. Zumindest will keines der beteiligten Länder schuld sein am Scheitern. Regelmäßiger Shuttle-Service, heißt das, dann kann jeder da hoch ins All? Regelmäßiger Shuttle-Service für Nutzlasten, das heißt Versorgungsgüter, aber auch für immer neue Module. Insgesamt über 60 Flüge bis zum Jahre 2004 stehen jetzt auf dem Manifest, auf der Liste der Flüge. Russische, amerikanische Träger, aber auch die Ariane-Rakete wird zum Erfolg dieser internationalen Be äh, Raumstation beitragen. Die ist ja unglaublich teuer, diese Station. 180 Milliarden haben wir gerade gehört. Ist das nötig? Sie ist nicht billig, sagen wir mal mhm. so. Und wir arbeiten daran, dass sie preiswert ist. Denn sie ist ein ähm, Außenposten der Menschheit im All. Erstmals schließen sich alle raumfahrtführenden Nationen zusammen, um das zu verwirklichen. Das ist eigentlich auch ein kulturelles Projekt, was da mhm. äh, entsteht. Die, die Beiträge und die Begründungen für diese Raumstation sind so vielfältig eben auch wie diese äh, Nationen, die da mitmachen. Da hat es politische Gründe, wissenschaftliche Gründe. Das heißt, wir vor allen Dingen in Europa möchten das Bestmögliche an Wissenschaft auf diese Station bringen. Wir haben die Möglichkeit, sehr viel schneller auch Experimente an Bord dieser Raumstation zu bringen, als jetzt mit der Flugreihenfolge, die wir bisher hatten, wo wir zwei, drei Jahre immer noch zwischen den Flügen warten mussten. Sie sind Astronaut, Sie sagen durchaus sinnvoll natürlich. Aber wer zahlt das Projekt eigentlich? Das Geld wird ja nicht ins Weltall geschossen und verpulvert, sondern das wird auf der Erde ausgegeben. Da schaut man natürlich drauf, dass die Beiträge, die die Länder aus staatlichen Budgets leisten, auch wieder zurückfließen. Ob das jetzt Kritik ergibt wegen versteckter Subventionen, wie auch immer. Jedenfalls wird es auf der Erde ausgegeben. Und diese Zahlen, die Von genannt werden, die muss man natürlich auf die 14 Jahre jetzt verschmieren, die diese Raumstation in Betrieb sein will. Die MIR-Station war für fünf Jahre geplant, ist zwölf Jahre betrieben worden. Die Raumstation, die jetzt entsteht, kann sicherlich auch viel länger uns nutzen als das, was momentan angedacht ist. Kann es dadurch auch leichter werden? Wir haben ja vorhin schon mal gesagt, es gibt einen Shuttle-Service, auch für normale Menschen eventuell irgendwann mal ins All zu kommen. Das ist eine andere Linie, die nicht zuletzt durch den Flug von John Glenn vielleicht jetzt auch wieder neue Hoffnung erfährt. 
der Transport äh, von Gütern, von Menschen jetzt alles noch sehr teuer und sehr aufwendig. Das ist etwas, wo man also wirklich sich darauf jetzt momentan konzentriert, Nutzlasten hochzubringen. Aber es ist ja nicht gesagt, dass die Raketen billiger werden. Sie sollten bei gleicher Sicherheit dann auch in der Lage sein, 60, 80 Passagiere meinetwegen für einen Flug ins All zu bringen. Und es gibt durchaus ernstzunehmende Stimmen, auch Astronauten, die sich äh, auf diesem Gebiet eben hervortun, die sagen, das muss auch ein Ziel der Zukunft sein, das Weltall wirklich dann auch mehr Menschen als bisher äh, zu öffnen. Hanold Ewald, dieses Projekt, die Mission von John Glenn noch einmal mit 77 ins All zu dürfen, das ist ja sowas wie ein amerikanischer Traum. Wenn man es nur will, wenn man es nur versucht, dann wird es auch wahr. Was würden Sie denn deutschen Kindern sagen, die Astronaut werden wollen? Lohnt sich das? Gibt es wirklich reelle Chancen, dass man irgendwann mal da oben landet? Auf jeden Fall ist es richtig hoch zu zielen. Also die Ansprüche und die Ziele, die man sich setzt, sehr hoch anzusetzen und an dies, zu diesem Ziel hinzuarbeiten. Nicht jeder, der in einem Raumfahrtprojekt mitarbeitet, kann natürlich dann auch letztlich fliegen, aber am Boden wie an Bord. Raumfahrt ist so faszinierend, dass ich in diesen Teams immer eine besondere Stimmung erlebt mhm. habe, die dieses Projekt trägt, die also auch Nachtschichten selbstverständlich macht bis zum Start und darüber hinaus dann in der Unterstützung dessen, der es dann nun wirklich geschafft hat, auch das Ticket ins All zu kriegen. Reinhold Ewald, Sie waren schon mal im All, Sie hatten das Ticket bekommen. Herzlichen Glückwunsch nochmal nachträglich. Vielleicht klappt es ja nochmal und allen anderen sei gesagt, nur Mut. Man kann abheben, wenn man nur möchte. John Glenn, der zeigt es Ihnen im Moment. And the shuttle's youngest crew member has now become a star back home. The crew of the space shuttle Discovery got down to work on Friday with 77-year-old John Glenn more than earning his keep. Meanwhile, Glenn reported a beautiful view as Discovery passed over Perth, Australia, where residents turned on their lights in honour of Glenn. For an update, we now go to CNN's Tony Clark at the Johnson Space Centre in Houston, Texas. Tony, what's been happening? Well, you know, the, the lights of Perth were really kind of a neat thing because it goes back to the, the 30, 36 years when John Glenn went over there the first time. And so that's kind of one of the, the nice things, both for him and those of us that, that watch the space program, that tie between, the, uh, between Perth and, uh, and the uh, uh, space shuttle uh, Discovery. One of the things they did today, the Pansat satellite, that's a petite uh, amateur uh, satellite that the Naval uh, Postgraduate School in uh, California has had deployed the shuttle deployed that it's only about 19 inches in diameter it was a small uh, satellite in fact it went by the screen so very very fast and uh, they deployed that today there will be another satellite deployment on Sunday but most of the time I'll tell you the astronauts have been doing a variety of experiments on the uh, the shuttle itself in the space hab module we had a chance to uh, see John Glenn and uh, Pedro Duque working in the space hab module today and and then uh, we have also had them working on the uh, remote manipulator arm, and so it has been a busy day. Shannon Lucid knows exactly what that's like. She's been up in the space shuttle five times. It gets very busy, even though we don't see the astronauts. You all are, are very busy up there? Oh, right. You're very, very busy. Every single second, it seems like, is uh, utilized. How difficult is it to, to go through your routine working in a weightless condition? It's really not all that difficult at all. It's just the thing that just amazes me constantly every time I've been up is how very rapidly the human body adapts to different situations and how very rapidly the human body adapts and you feel like this is home and this is how we were meant to live. All your work is is very closely choreographed, isn't it? I mean, every step of the way, uh, scientists have worked with, with the astronauts to say, okay, at this point, here's what you do and how you do it and what to look for. Right, and for the typical space have space lab type mission, you have gone through the timeline many, many times so that you can get everything in in the allotted time. In, in the uh, day, a little more than a day, the uh, shuttle has been up. We have only seen just a very minor problem. There was a, a leak in a, a new system in the water system that was be, being treated, a portion of a thermal blanket on one of the uh, Ohms pods. I mean, this is really very much a flawless uh, mission considering how many pieces there are. Oh, that's right. And I don't know how closely you follow the missions, you know, the last few years, but we have been... And the shuttle has just been operating very, very successfully. It's just amazing. It amazes me every single time how 
all those thousands and thousands of parts and all of that can work together and produce such a magnificent machine is just amazing. This is very much an international mission with uh, two right. international astronauts. Is that something that you and NASA feel is important to make this an international uh, space ad exploration? Well, you know, we're headed into the era of the International Space Station. Next month will be the first launch of that uh, uh, new phase of space flight. And I do. I think it's very, very, I think it's tremendous that all the different nations of the world are working together to do this because, as you most probably are aware, space exploration is extremely expensive. And it's something that just one nation would not be able to do on their own. But all the nations of Earth working together can accomplish. And not only that, I think it's very, very important that the nations work together because, you know, the exploration of space is for everybody here on the planet Earth, not just one nation. So I really appreciate the international aspects of the space flight. Shannon Lucid, thank you very much. Much more to come, many more days ahead as we monitor the activities of the astronauts on the Space uh, Shuttle Discovery. I'm Tony Clark, CNN, at the Johnson Space Center. Jahren auf der Erde ist der Astronaut John Glenn wieder dort, wo er sich am liebsten aufhält, im Weltall. Seit einem Tag kreist der 77-Jährige in der Raumfähre Discovery um die Erde. Und wie bereits im Jahre 1962 haben sich die Bewohner der australischen Stadt Perth auch heute wieder eine Überraschung ausgedacht. Sie zündeten alle Lichter an, um den Astronauten zu grüßen. Es war der Gruß der besonderen Art. Alle Energieressourcen mussten für den denkwürdigen Tag leuchten, was sie hergeben konnten. Aus 560 Kilometer Höhe sah John Glenn die Festbeleuchtung, als er mit der Discovery über den Kontinent flog. Ihr habt's aber ziemlich hell heute Nacht, grüßte der Oldie zurück zur Erde. Er fühle sich gut. Die Stimmung in den Staaten ist nahezu euphorisch. Mit Glens Reise scheint der Zauber der Flüge in ein Land zurückgekommen zu sein, in dem Weltraummissionen kaum noch Beachtung finden. Clinton nannte Glens Start einen großen Tag für Amerikas Senioren. Der erfahrene Astronaut wird das auch bald zu spüren bekommen. An ihm selbst soll der Alterungsprozess des Menschen im Weltraum getestet werden. CNN's Miles O'Brien joins us now from Johnson Space Center in Texas with the latest on the shuttle. Miles? Ralph, by all accounts, John Glenn is in zero G and feeling fine once again. Ground controllers here in Houston have high praise for he and the rest of the Discovery crew. They say they are actually ahead of a very demanding timeline already. Let's take a look from way upstairs looking down. Some beauty shots shot from the orbiter Discovery. It is currently in its 19th orbit, just passing over the Caribbean having a good time indeed up in space. Earlier, John Glenn and the man they're calling Juan Glenn, Pedro Duque, the first Spaniard in space and a national hero there, got right to work on some of the experiments in the shuttle's mid-deck. And just about a half an hour ago, we had a briefing from pilot Steve Lindsay, Commander Kurt Brown, and payload specialist number two, John Glenn. Take care of it. So it's been a great, uh, great first day. We're up into our well into the second day now in space second 24 hour period and uh, i think almost everything is right on timeline so far and uh, we just want to keep it that way and make sure we get back all the as good results as we possibly can on all the research experiments that are on board for that's the main reason we're up here Earlier, the citizens of Perth, Australia, offered a nostalgic greeting to John Glenn and his six crewmates aboard Discovery. As they passed over Perth, Australia, they shined lights upward, just as they did 36 years ago when John Glenn first went into orbit. Cape is Discovery. Uh, this job, we got a real good view. There's a little break in the clouds right there. Some clouds around. We got a good view of Perth, a nice glow, and uh, spread out. And uh, it's been a long time ago. I looked at the same thing from a little lower altitude, but it looks beautiful up here. You can pass that along to the people of Perth. We send our best regards. Now, if you watched the launch yesterday, you'll recall it was flawless except for one little point. The door which covers over the drag chute right at the base of the orbiter fell off right at launch time. Ground controllers have been looking into this problem for quite some time now, and they say basically it's not going to affect the flight whatsoever. They still are planning to land at the Kennedy Space Center, 
It's just that the orbiter will roll an extra one or 2,000 feet. They say that the drag chute is probably intact and just exposed to the void in space, and that the heat of reentry on that drag chute would be probably only about 100 degrees, so they're not worried about it burning up. Miles O'Brien, CNN, reporting live from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Ralph? Miles, while much of the attention is on John Glenn, of course, two other Discovery astronauts are making history as well. Chiaki Muki is the first Japanese to travel in space twice. She already holds the title of the first Japanese woman in space. The 46-year-old is a heart surgeon. She's going to help Glenn with his medical tests and conduct research in the shuttle's mini laboratory. Astronaut Pedro Duque is making Spain very proud, and it is not because he is the youngest member of the Discovery crew. Correspondent Al Goodman has his story. Blast off for Discovery, celebration in Spain. Spain is happy that veteran John Glenn is back in space, but here they're talking more about Pedro Duque, the first Spanish astronaut to reach the heavens. Okay, I think this is great because I think this is this could be the first step to send a Spanish crew to the space. I would like um, uh, many young people of Spain uh, study for this uh, space adventure. It's very important for Spain. <laughs> it's also very important for one Pedro Duque. At age 35, he's the youngest astronaut aboard Discovery. An aeronautical engineer, he's been training more than six years for the flight. His mission, to conduct dozens of scientific experiments. We're taking enormous care with the experiments, almost guarding them jealously. His exploits are front page news in Spain. One newspaper headline said, Duque and Glenn make history. Duque is aboard Discovery representing the European Space Agency, which followed the launch from a site near Madrid. We have been waiting for a number of years to see Pedro Duque on board. I hope uh, the, the trip uh, be the, uh, a wonderful thing for all of us. Duque says that spaceflight is a little like bullfighting in that you have to have a healthy dose of fear to do the job right. And he is adding other Spanish touches aboard Discovery. I'm taking a Spanish sausage and cheese to brighten up the dinner aboard. He has earned the respect of others. We got a good man here, glad he's here. <laughs> There's a famous saying here that Madrid is the next best thing to heaven. Pedro Duque, born in Madrid, has decided to check that out for himself. Al Goodman for CNN, Madrid. Still on the subject of space, the first piece of the International Space Station is scheduled for launch next month. Russian news reports say the Russian-built power and propulsion module is due to be placed into orbit on November 20th. NASA will follow in December with the launch of the second piece, a passageway built by the United States. Construction on the third part has been delayed for two years because Russia has been unable to pay its share of the cost. Still evening after the excitement of the shuttle launch, today gave way to the realities and routine of space travel for the crew of Discovery and its elder statesman, John Glenn. Waking this morning to Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World and a breakfast of oatmeal, apple cider, and chocolate drink, John Glenn conducted experiments on weightlessness and aging. Glenn also had time to take in the sights, float around the cabin, and enjoy it all. Miles O'Brien joins me now live from the Johnson Space Center with the latest. Miles? Hello, Lou. Zero G, and he is feeling fine. As a matter of fact, ground controllers are saying the whole crew is doing remarkably well. It's a very busy timeline, and they're actually ahead of their timeline early in the mission, indicating that things are going smoothly in orbit. Now, just about an hour ago, John Glenn, along with Commander Kurt Brown and Pilot Steve Lindsay, offered us a little briefing of how things are going in orbit. Being able to float around like this in zero G, is I just wish everyone could experience this. Uh, you know, uh, there's been a track record in the past of a, a high percentage of the people getting sick uh, sometime within the first day or two. Uh, but fortunately, the crew has felt fine up here this time, and we've been doing real well. Uh, I had my own concerns about that because when I went up before, it was uh, I was strapped to the spacecraft, and so I didn't really get this free-floating feeling uh, like you have here. But you have a lot of problems, like uh, eating food that has to be controlled, or if it gets away from you, it gets... 
Earlier, a U.S. Navy satellite called PANSAT got that free-floating feeling. It was deployed flawlessly by Discovery. It'll be used to test out systems which may one day be used to find down flyers, for example. Now, the only problem yesterday and what was other, uh, otherwise a flawless launch was the door, which covers the drag chute at the base of the uh, Space Shuttle Discovery. And you probably have seen the shots right by now. The door actually comes off and hits the bell of engine number one. It didn't cause any damage to the engine as far as we know right now. Of course, we'll have to check that out later. Nevertheless, that little piece broke into about 18 pieces. The question is, how will this affect the mission? Ground controllers here in Houston say not much at all. That's, what, that's how the door would look if it were still in one piece. They found it in about 18 pieces. They're investigating as to why it came off, and they also want to find out in the future if they need to redesign that door for any reason. Now, Glenn also uh, spent some time setting up his experiments. After all, there are about 15 experiments which he is actively engaged in. He and Pedro Duque, the first Spaniard in space, spent some time on the mid-deck getting their experiments ready, getting up and uh, ready to do the work in space, which is ahead over this next week. Miles O'Brien, CNN, reporting live from the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Hey, Miles, thank you. It was uh, 36 years ago that the people of Perth, Australia, sent John Glenn a message of good luck as he orbited overhead by turning on every light in the city. The people of Perth did it again for the old space traveler, repeating their gesture with a glow that warmed his heart. John Glenn sent his thanks and said it's been a long time since he had seen that sight and call it habit, but when Glenn called the Johnson Space Center, he began his transmission by saying Cape, as in Cape Canaveral, instead of Houston. In 1962, when John Glenn flew for the first time, there was no Houston Space Center. It was all set at the Cape, and there was no Kennedy Space Center either. John Kennedy was still President of the United States. Well, something that wasn't even science fiction in 1962 is playing an important role in today's flight, the Internet. Websites reported record hits during yesterday's launch. CNN's website recorded its highest traffic ever, almost half a million hits per minute before liftoff. Those numbers shattered the previous record set in September when Congress released the Star Report on the Internet. We had a wonderful uh, ride up yesterday, and uh, I was uh, keyed into to every, every little uh, noise and quiver that the... Uh, that we made on the way up, and it was quite different than the ride I got before, of course, back a long, long time ago. But actually, there, there are really a couple of aspects of things uh, up here, the the personal aspects of just how you operate in, uh, in this kind of an environment, and the other, of course, is all the research of some 83 different research projects we've had going on board and trying to get all those things uh, fired up and started on the, uh, during this, this first day period. Most of those things get activated within the, at least within the first, uh, somewhere around 36 to 48 hours, I think everything is activated. And uh, some of the ones came up powered, and those are ones we'll be servicing uh, as we go along. And those are, are done uh, by people being assigned as prime responsibilities for that particular research project. For more on the events on board the Space Shuttle Discovery, here's CNN's Tony Clark with their reports. The first full day on orbit was a busy one for the crew of Discovery, setting up experiments like the advanced gradient heating furnace designed to create alloys in microgravity, as well as a system designed to grow crystals in space, okay. and well, trying out an electronic good. nose, a device to check for various so gases in the shuttle. Shot. There are also a number of medical experiments underway uh, on the going. astronauts themselves. Uh, one I've been involved with here is a body core temperature measuring device where I take a pill about the size of the biggest vitamin pill you ever saw, and it monitors my, monitors my core body temperature, and it's recorded on a little device that you can see right here on my waist. Friday, the crew unhooked the shuttle's remote manipulator arm and slowly maneuvered it up and around in preparation for Sunday's deployment of the Spartan satellite. The arm will be used to lift the satellite out of the shuttle's payload bay and leave it in space for two days of observations of the sun's corona. Just about 40 seconds away from deploy of PANSAT. The astronauts also deployed the Navy's small PANSAT communication satellite. 
It will be used for educational purposes by the Naval Postgraduate School in California. The satellite will be used as a space bulletin board, very similar to email, except it uses amateur radio. There was also a bit of nostalgia as the shuttle orbited 343 miles above Earth. Residents in Perth, Australia turned on all the lights in town, just as they did 36 years ago when John Glenn passed over in his Mercury capsule. And once again, Glenn was able to look down and see Australia's City of Lights. We got a good view of Perth, a nice glow, and uh, spread out, and uh, been a long time ago, I looked at the same thing from a little lower altitude, but it looks beautiful up here, and you can pass that along to the people of Perth. We Everything appears to be running smoothly on Discovery. NASA engineers are still trying to figure out why the door covering Discovery's drag chute fell off during launch. They believe the chute is still packed in its compartment, and will not affect the mission or the landing. The only other real problem the shuttle has experienced has been a leaky hose in a drinking water system that was being tested. The astronauts changed back to their old water processor, so all in all, this shuttle mission has gotten off to an excellent start. Tony Clark, CNN, Johnson Space Center. Is that so? Yeah, the Americans are in the flying in the world, and the Deutschen are in Mallorca. Ich meine, ich finde das also irgendwie komisch. Opa wird in der Weltraum geschossen. Ja, ich meine, ist das jetzt die neue Lösung für Trendenprobleme oder was? Also, ich frage mich, und wohin sollen eigentlich dann diese ganzen Fernsehsatelliten, wenn die ganzen Umlaufbahnen nur Rentner rumschwören? Das ist ja Wahnsinn. Also, ich meine, ich persönlich habe mich ja auch für eine Raumfahrt mal. Äh Ja, das ist bei mir nur leider an der Schwerelosigkeit gescheitert. <lacht> Tut mir leid. Also dieser, dieser John Glenn ist ja im Grunde schon ein, wäre ein Gewinn für den Sitzungskarneval, weil dort gibt es nur über 70-Jährige, die keine Rakete mehr wert sind. Aber bleiben wir jetzt mal beim Thema Greise im Weltall. Ich meine, es tut mir leid, es ist äh, unvermeidlich. Ich glaube, ich, äh, ich muss es wieder tun. Ja, tu es. Mach es. Na, also. <lacht> also, eins muss ich ja mal sagen. Dieser John Glenn, das ist ja nur die Vorhaut, die Vorhut. Von, von ist nur die Vorhaut, Vorhut. Von uns Alten. Nein, die einen sagen, das ist ja noch die beste Methode, die grauen Panther im im schwarzen Loch verschwinden zu lassen. Aber ich habe ja auch diesen, diesen Flugzettel gekriegt von der NASA. Hier steht es ja auch drauf. NASA, abgekürzt, neue attraktive Seniorenausflüge. Und ich, ich, les, ich lese das mal vor. Montag, 6. Dezember, Tagesausflug im Cookie Dent Shuttle. Weil jetzt auch für Rentner die Galaxis ein Klacks ist. Und jetzt, jetzt kommt's. Überwin überwinden Sie die Schwerkraft. Heben Sie mal so richtig ab, nicht nur beim Kanaster. <lacht> denn, denn wir machen da weiter, wo Ihr Treppenlift aufhört. <lacht> Sehen Sie? Sehen Sie? Sehen Sie? Sehen Sie? Ent oh. Sehen Sie? Sehen Sie, sehen Sie endlich Sterne ohne Medikamente? Entdecken Sie einmal große Wasserflächen unter sich, ohne ein schlechtes Gewissen zu haben. Erleben Sie. Oh Mann. Erleben Sie. Erleben Sie. Erleben Sie fliegende Untertaschen, die nicht von Ihrem Pfleger stammen. Und genießen Sie auch Astronautennahrung, die noch feiner püriert ist, als Sie es ohnehin brauchen. Und hier steht noch das Motto, mit der Zeit werden Alte schwerelos. Und das finde ich Quatsch, weil ich würde eher sagen, Zeit ist das Schwerelos der Alten. <lacht> Ermittlungen gegen Sonderermittler. Im Zusammenhang mit der Clinton-Lewinsky-Affäre wird nun auch gegen das Büro von US-Sonderermittler Star ermittelt. Es soll vertrauliche Informationen aus dem Gerichtssaal an die Presse weitergegeben haben. US-Präsident Clinton war unter Ausschluss der Öffentlichkeit zu seiner Affäre mit der Ex-Praktikantin vernommen worden. Eine Bundesrichterin ernannte in Washington einen Sonderermittler, der nun die Vorwürfe gegen Star prüfen soll. Erfolgreiche Weltraummission. Ohne größere Probleme verläuft bislang der Flug der Raumfähre Discovery. 
Die Astronauten, unter ihnen der 77-jährige Weltraumveteran John Glenn, haben einen Kommunikationssatelliten ausgesetzt. Dieser war von Studenten aus Kalifornien entworfen und montiert worden. Am Sonntag soll ein weiterer Satellit zur Sonnenbeobachtung ins All befördert werden. In just a couple of hours, crew members aboard the shuttle Discovery are scheduled to get their wake-up call from ground controllers. Saturday will be day three of the space flight. On Friday, the crew got a glowing greeting from the people of Australia. CNN Sean Caleb's recaps the mission so far. In a televised briefing with NASA, John Glenn, along with Commander Kurt Brown and pilot Stephen Lindsay, described the flight into orbit. It has been a great ride so far. As Kurt said, we had a wonderful uh, ride up yesterday, and uh, I was uh, keyed in to, to every, every little uh, noise and quiver that, the, uh, that we made on the way up, and it was quite different than the ride I got before, of course, back a long, long time ago. The crew has been working on just some of the scores of experiments it hopes to complete before returning to Earth, including the release of a small experimental naval communication satellite. But much of the focus has been on the 77-year-old payload specialist. Glenn is only involved in 10 of Discovery's 83 experiments, but NASA says Glenn is pulling his weight. This crew has been very busy in the last 24 hours. So from a medical perspective, this crew hit the ground running, and they've been doing an absolutely spectacular job. Perth, Australia, which bills itself as the City of Lights, kept its lights blazing for the shuttle passing overhead, recreating a welcome sent to John Glenn 36 years ago when he became the first American to orbit the Earth. Glenn was able to wax philosophical about his Mercury days and relay humorous news about this trip. Like uh, this morning, I had some oatmeal and raisins that I had, had uh, fixed out of the galley. One little speck wound up on my glasses. And uh, I guess with old folks, you normally think it goes down on an old man's necktie. But on this one, it wound up up on my glasses. And so you have to think of things like that. It hasn't all been fun, and it hasn't all gone smoothly. Back here on the ground, NASA has launched two separate investigations, trying to determine how the shuttle's drag chute door ripped off during Thursday's liftoff. Sean Caleb's CNN at Mission Control in Houston. He waited 36 years for a second shot. John Glenn tastes the glory of being back in space. That's coming up, but first a look at this week's movements on the world's financial markets. The crew of the Space Shuttle Discovery was treated to a light show, the likes of which hasn't been seen in 36 years. The city of Perth in Australia greeted the astronauts as they flew far overhead by turning on all its lights in honor of 77-year-old astronaut John Glenn. Perth did the same thing back in 1962 when Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. Glenn denies that this is a mission about him, but many space watchers are keeping an eye on the world's oldest astronaut. CNN's Sean Caleb's looks at the man with a mission. Four hours and 55 minutes in space made John Glenn an American hero for life. Just three Earth orbits, but this was 1962. The Cold War, the space race was on, and the Russians were the bad guys. Back in the old days, we're just trying to figure out, could we do it? By strapping into Friendship 7 and completing the successful mission, Glenn proved NASA could do it. Glenn had proven himself flying combat missions in World War II and the Korean War. But flying in a spacecraft was far different. A devoted husband to wife Annie and a father of two, Glenn was now a household name. He cemented his image as a clean living, God-fearing Marine speaking to Congress after his space flight. As our knowledge of this universe in which we live increases, may God grant us the wisdom and guidance to use it wisely. But while Glenn watched other astronauts push the envelope further and further, he found himself grounded. A decision by then President Kennedy, who didn't want an American icon to die young. Disappointed and disillusioned, Glenn quit the space program in 1965 eventually turning to politics. Everybody's out there tomorrow, whatever it snows or not. In 1984, the U.S. Senator from Ohio made a run at the presidency. It was an ill-fated candidacy. It never really took off. Steering clear of conservative or liberal labels, Glenn targeted what he called the sensible center. But my problem was in the primaries, the sensible center didn't get out and vote in those numbers, and so my candidacy was rather short-lived. 
Years later, Glenn learned Ronald Reagan had considered him the number one Democratic challenger. In 1996, while preparing for a Senate budget debate on NASA, Glenn had an epiphany. Space was the perfect site to study the effects of aging, and he would be the perfect guinea pig. NASA Chief Dan Golden weighed the risks and the benefits and cleared the senator to fly. John Glenn is a great American hero. We owe him a second flight. Glenn is now a 77-year-old payload specialist. As he began training, critics called it a colossal waste of money and derided the importance of aging experiments. If we can afford to send somebody for nothing more than a nostalgia trip, uh, it calls into question what those billion dollar flights are really for. True to his nature, Glenn stayed above the fray, embracing the chance to view the planet from an orbit 300 miles above Earth and allowing millions of people to watch a hero's career come full circle. Sean Caleb's CNN. Five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Discovery with a crew of six astronaut heroes and one American legend. Erinnerungen an 1962, als das Kontrollzentrum heute Abend John Glenn und seine sechs Discovery-Kollegen in den Weltraum schickte. Mehr als eine Viertelmillion Zuschauer verfolgten am Kennedy-Weltraumzentrum den Bilderbuchstart der Raumfähre, der sich noch zuletzt um 19 Minuten verzögert hatte, weil ein Flugzeug sich ins Startgebiet verirrte. So viele Journalisten, Fernsehkameras und Satellitentrucks waren noch nie bei einem NASA-Start. Das US-Fernsehen sendete stundenlang live von hier. Aus Washington war Präsident Clinton gekommen mit vielen Kongressmitgliedern. Alle wollten dabei sein, wenn ein richtiger amerikanischer Held seinen Lebenstraum verwirklicht. 36 Jahre hatte der erste Amerikaner im Weltraum auf diesen zweiten Flug warten müssen. Inzwischen war er Senator in Washington geworden, aber seinen Traum hatte er nie aufgegeben. Als man ihn heute in den Mittelsitz im Shuttle hiefte, war Glenn gelassen, wie immer. Mit 40 Jahren war John Glenn schon beim ersten Ausflug ins All 1962 der älteste der US-Astronauten. Die Erwartung war groß damals, denn die Russen waren den Amerikanern mit Yuri Gagarin als erste Menschen im Weltraum zuvorgekommen. Die Mercury-Kapsel von Glenn war so klein, dass er sich darin kaum bewegen konnte. Gott gibt dir Geschwindigkeit, John Glenn, wünschte die Bodenstation und beim elften Startversuch klappte endlich alles. Nur vier Stunden und 55 Minuten dauerte das Abenteuer. Präsident Kennedy dekorierte den Helden, der Amerika seinen Stolz zurückgegeben hatte. Die USA im Freudentaumel. Mitten im Kalten Krieg hatte man es den Russen gezeigt. Der Wettlauf zum Mond konnte beginnen. Kein Fitnessprogramm für Senioren war es, das Glenn diesmal überstehen musste. Doch die Ärzte sagten, der 77-Jährige ist topfit. Wie bedient man einen Laptop? Viel Neues musste er lernen, denn seine Raumkapsel hatte damals keinen einzigen Computer. Experimente über das Altern im All, das ist offiziell die Aufgabe der Glenn-Mission. Kritiker sehen das Ganze aber eher als gigantische PR-Aktion der NASA, um mehr Geld für die Raumfahrt in Washington locker zu machen. Der Einstieg ist auch beim Shuttle etwas mühevoll, aber verglichen mit seiner Minikapsel verbringt der Weltraumsenior die nächsten knapp neun Tage schwebend im Luxus-Apartment. Während die Discovery im blauen Himmel über Florida verschwindet, zum letzten Flug vor der Internationalen Raumstation zusammen mit den Russen, kann John Glenn den Ausblick genießen, auf den er so lange gewartet hat. Den Blick zurück auf den blauen Planeten.